The Swiss Family Robinson, or Adventures in a Desert Island, by Johann David Wyss. Introduction It is very well known that, some years ago, Councillor Horner, a Swiss, made a voyage round the world in the Russian vessel La Podesta, commanded by Captain Krusenstern. They discovered many islands, and amongst others, one very large and fertile, till then unknown to navigators, to the southwest of Java, near the coast of New Guinea. They landed here, and to the great surprise of Mr. Horner, he was received by a family who spoke to him in German. They were a father and mother, and four robust and hearty sons. Their history was very interesting. The father was a Swiss clergyman who, in the revolution of 1798, had lost all his fortune, and had determined to emigrate in order to seek elsewhere the means of supporting his family. He went first to England with his wife and children, consisting of four sons between the ages of twelve and five. He there undertook the office of missionary to Otaheite, not that he intended to remain on that uncivilized island, but he wished to proceed from thence to Port Jackson as a free colonist. He invested his little capital in seeds of every description and some cattle to take out with him. They had a prosperous voyage till they were near the coast of New Guinea, when they were overtaken by a frightful storm. At this period he commenced his journal, which he afterwards committed to the care of Mr. Horner, to be forwarded to his friends in Switzerland. Some time before, a boat from an English vessel, the Adventurer, had visited them, and the father had sent the first part of his journal by Lieutenant Bell to the captain, who remained in the vessel. A violent tempest arose, which continued some days, and drove the Adventurer from the coast. The family concluded the ship was lost, but this was not the case, as will be seen in the conclusion. CHAPTER One. The tempest had raged for six days, and on the seventh seemed to increase. The ship had been so far driven from its course, that no one on board knew where they were. Everyone was exhausted with fatigue and watching. The shattered vessel began to leak in many places, the oaths of the sailors were changed to prayers, and each thought only how to save his own life. Children, said I, to my terrified boys, who were clinging round me, God can save us if he will. To him nothing is impossible. But if he thinks it good to call us to him, let us not murmur. We shall not be separated. My excellent wife dried her tears, and from that moment became more tranquil. We knelt down to pray for the help of our Heavenly Father, and the fervor and emotion of my innocent boys proved to me that even children can pray, and find in prayer consolation and peace. We rose from our knees, strengthened to bear the afflictions that hung over us. Suddenly, we heard amid the roaring of the waves the cry of, Land! Land! At that moment, the ship struck on a rock. The concussion threw us down. We heard a loud cracking, as if the vessel were parting asunder. We felt that we were aground, and heard the captain cry in a tone of despair, We are lost! Launch the boats! These words were a dagger to my heart, and the lamentations of my children were louder than ever. I then recollected myself, and said, Courage, my darlings, we are still above water, and the land is near. God helps those who trust in Him. Remain here, and I will endeavor to save us. I went on deck, and was instantly thrown down, and wet through by a huge sea. A second followed. I struggled boldly with the waves, and succeeded in keeping myself up when I saw, with terror, the extent of our wretchedness. The shattered vessel was almost in two. The crew had crowded into the boats, and the last sailor was cutting the rope. I cried out, and prayed them to take us with them, but my voice was drowned in the roar of the tempest, nor could they have returned for us through waves that ran mountains high. All hope from their assistance was lost but I was consoled by observing that the water did not enter the ship above a certain height. The stern, under which lay the cabin which contained all that was dear to me on earth, was immovably fixed between two rocks. At the same time I observed, towards the south, traces of land, 
which, though wild and barren, were now the haven of my almost expiring hopes, no longer being able to depend on any human aid. I returned to my family, and endeavoured to appear calm. "'Take courage,' cried I. "'There is yet hope for us. The vessel, in striking between the rocks, is fixed in a position which protects our cabin above the water, and if the wind should settle to-morrow, we may possibly reach the land.' This assurance calmed my children, and, as usual, they depended on all I told them. They rejoiced that the heaving of the vessel had ceased, as, while it lasted, they were continually thrown against each other. My wife, more accustomed to read my countenance, discovered my uneasiness, and by a sign I explained to her that I had lost all hope. I felt great consolation in seeing that she supported our misfortune with truly Christian resignation. "'Let us take some food,' said she. "'With the body the mind is strengthened. This must be a night of trial.' Night came, and the tempest continued its fury, tearing away the planks from the devoted vessel with a fearful crashing. It appeared absolutely impossible that the boats could have outlived the storm. My wife had prepared some refreshment, of which the children partook with an appetite that we would not feel. Three younger ones retired to their beds, and soon slept soundly. Fritz, the eldest, watched with me. "'I have been considering,' said he, "'how we could save ourselves. If we only had some cork jackets or bladders for Mama and my brothers—you and I don't need them—we could then swim to land.' A good thought, said I. I will try during the night to contrive some expedient to secure our safety. We found some small empty barrels in the cabin, which we tied two together with our handkerchiefs, leaving a space between for each child, and fastened this new swimming apparatus under our arms. My wife prepared the same for herself. We then collected some knives, string, tinder-box, and such little necessaries as we could put in our pockets. Thus, in case the vessel should fall to pieces during the night, we hoped we might be enabled to reach land. At length Fritz, overcome with fatigue, lay down and slept with his brothers. My wife and I, too anxious to rest, spent that dreadful night in prayer and in arranging various plans. How gladly we welcomed the light of day shining through an opening! The wind was subsiding, the sky serene, and I watched the sun rise with renewed hope. I called my wife and children on deck. The younger ones were surprised to find we were alone. They inquired what had become of the sailors, and how we should manage the ship alone. Children, said I, one more powerful than man has protected us till now and will still extend a saving arm to us if we do not give way to complaint and despair. Let all hands set to work. Remember that excellent maxim, God helps those who help themselves. Let us all consider what is best to do now. Let us leap into the sea, cried Fritz, and swim to the shore. Very well for you, replied Ernest, who can swim, but we should all be drowned. Would it not be better to construct a raft and go all together? That might do, added I, if we were strong enough for such a work, and if a raft was not always so dangerous a conveyance. But away, boys, look about you, and seek for anything that might be useful to us. We all dispersed to different parts of the vessel. For my own part I went to the provision room, to look after the casks of water and other necessaries of life. My wife visited the livestock and fed them, for they were almost famished. Fritz sought for arms and ammunition, Ernest for the carpenter's tools. Jack had opened the captain's cabin and was immediately thrown down by two large dogs, who leaped on him so roughly that he cried out as if they were going to devour him. However, hunger had rendered them so docile that they licked his hands, and he soon recovered his feet, seized the largest by the ears, and, mounting his back, gravely rode up to me as I was coming from the hold. I could not help laughing. I applauded his courage, but recommended him always to be prudent with animals of that kind, who are often dangerous when hungry. 
my little troop began to assemble. Fritz had found two fowling pieces, some bags of powder and shot, and some balls in horn flasks. Ernest was loaded with an axe and hammer, a pair of pincers, a large pair of scissors, and an auger showed itself half out of his pocket. Francis had a large box under his arm, from which he eagerly produced what he had called little pointed hooks. His brothers laughed at his prize. "'Silence,' said I. "'The youngest has made the most valuable addition to our stores. These are fish-hooks, and may be more useful for the preservation of our lives than anything this ship contains. However, Fritz and Ernest have not done amiss.' "'For my part,' said my wife, "'I only contribute good news. I have found a cow, an ass, two goats, six sheep, and a sow with young. I have fed them, and hope we may preserve them." "'Very well,' said I to my little workman. I am satisfied with all but Master Jack, who, instead of anything useful, has contributed two great eaters, who will do us more harm than good." "'They can help us to hunt when we get to land,' said Jack. "'Yes,' replied I. But can you devise any means of our getting there?" "'It does not seem at all difficult,' said the spirited little fellow. "'Put us each into a great tub, and let us float to shore. I remember sailing capitally that way on Godpapa's great pond at a very good idea, Jack. Good counsel may sometimes be given even by a child. Be quick, boys. Give me the saw and auger with some nails. We will see what we can do." I remembered seeing some empty casks in the hold. We went down and found them floating. This gave us less difficulty in getting them upon the lower deck, which was just above the water. They were of strong wood, bound with iron hoops, and exactly suited my purpose. My sons and I therefore began to saw them through the middle. After long labor we had eight tubs all the same height. We refreshed ourselves with wine and biscuit which we had found in some of the casks. I then contemplated with delight my little squadron of boats ranged in a line, and was surprised that my wife still continued depressed. She looked mournfully on them. I can never venture in one of those tubs, she said. Wait a little till my work is finished, replied I, and you will see it is more to be depended on than this broken vessel. I sought out a long, flexible plank and arranged eight tubs on it, close to each other, leaving a piece at each end to form a curve upwards, like the keel of a vessel. We then nailed them firmly to the plank, and to each other. We nailed a plank at each side, of the same length as the first, and succeeded in producing a sort of boat, divided into eight compartments, in which it did not appear difficult to make a short voyage over a calm sea. But. Unluckily, our wonderful vessel proved so heavy that our united efforts could not move it an inch. I sent Fritz to bring me the jack-screw, and in the meantime sawed a thick round pole into pieces. Then, raising the forepart of our work by means of the powerful machine, Fritz placed one of these rollers under it. Ernest was very anxious to know how this small machine could accomplish more than our united strength. I explained to him, as well as I could, the power of the lever of Archimedes, with which he had declared he could move the world if he had but a point to rest it on, and I promised my son to take the machine to pieces when we were on shore, and explain the mode of operation. I then told them that God, to compensate for the weakness of man, had bestowed on him reason, invention, and skill in workmanship. The result of these had produced a science which, under the name of mechanics, taught us to increase and extend our limited powers incredibly by the aid of instruments. Jack remarked that the jack screw worked very slowly. "'Better slowly than not at all,' said I. "'It is a principle in mechanics that what is gained in time is lost in power. The jack is not meant to work rapidly, but to raise heavy weights.' and the heavier the weight, the slower the operation. But can you tell me how we can make up for the slowness? Oh, by turning the handle quicker, to be sure. Quite wrong. 
that would not aid us at all. Patience and reason are the two fairies, by whose potent help I hope to get our boat afloat. I quickly proceeded to tie a strong cord to the after part of it, and the other end to a beam in the ship, which was still firm, leaving it long enough for security. Then, introducing two more rollers underneath, and working with a jack, we succeeded in launching our bark, which passed into the water with such velocity that but for our rope it would have gone out to sea. Unfortunately, it leaned so much on one side that none of the boys would venture into it. I was in despair, when I suddenly remembered it only wanted ballast to keep it in equilibrium. I hastily threw in anything I got hold of that was heavy, and soon had my boat level and ready for occupation. They now contended who should enter first, but I stopped them, reflecting that these restless children might easily capsize our vessel. I remembered that savage nations made use of an outrigger to prevent their canoe oversetting, and this I determined to add to my work. I fixed two portions of a topsail yard one over the prow, the other across the stern, in such a manner that they should not be in the way in pushing off our boat from the wreck. I forced the end of each yard into the bunghole of an empty brandy cask to keep them steady during our progress. It was now necessary to clear the way for our departure. I got into the first tub, and managed to get the boat into the cleft in the ship's side by way of a haven. I then returned and with the axe and saw, cut away right and left all that could obstruct our passage. Then we secured some oars, to be ready for our voyage next day. The day had passed in toil, and we were compelled to spend another night on the wreck, though we knew it might not remain until morning. We took a regular meal, for during the day we had scarcely had time to snatch a morsel of bread and a glass of wine. More composed than on the preceding night, we retired to rest. I took the precaution to fasten the swimming apparatus across the shoulders of my three younger children and my wife, for fear another storm might destroy the vessel and cast us into the sea. I also advised my wife to put on a sailor's dress as more convenient for her expected toils and trials. She reluctantly consented, and after a short absence, appeared in the dress of a youth who had served as a volunteer in the vessel. She felt very timid and awkward in her new dress, but I showed her the advantage of the change, and at last she was reconciled, and joined in the laughter of the children at her strange disguise. She then got into her hammock, and we enjoyed a pleasant sleep to prepare us for new labors. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 At break of day we were awake and ready, and after morning prayer I addressed my children thus. We are now, my dear boys, with the help of God, about to attempt our deliverance. Before we go, provide our poor animals with food for some days. We cannot take them with us, but if our voyage succeeds, we may return for them. Are you ready? Collect what you wish to carry away but only things absolutely necessary for our actual wants. I planned that our first cargo should consist of a barrel of powder, three fowling pieces, three muskets, two pair of pocket pistols, and one pair larger, ball, shot, and lead as much as we could carry, with a bullet mold, and I wished each of my sons, as well as their mother, should have a complete game bag, of which there were several in the officers' cabins. We then set apart a box of portable soup, another of biscuit, an iron pot, a fishing rod, a chest of nails, and one of carpenter's tools, also some sailcloth to make a tent. In fact, my boys collected so many things we were compelled to leave some behind, though I exchanged all the useless ballast for necessaries. When all was ready, we implored the blessing of God on our undertaking and prepared to embark in our tubs. At this moment the cocks crowed a sort of reproachful farewell to us. We had forgotten them. I immediately proposed to take our poultry with us, geese, ducks, fowls, and pigeons, for, as I observed to my wife, if we could not feed them, 
they would, at any rate, feed us. We placed our ten hens and two cocks in a covered tub, the rest we set at liberty, hoping the geese and ducks might reach the shore by water, and the pigeons by flight. We waited a little for my wife, who came loaded with a large bag, which she threw into the tub that contained her youngest son. I concluded it was intended to steady him, or for a seat, and made no observation of it. Here follows the order of our embarkation. In the first division sat the tender mother, the faithful and pious wife. In the second, our amiable little Francis, six years old, and of a sweet disposition. In the third, Fritz, our eldest, fourteen or fifteen years old, a curly-headed, clever, intelligent, and lively youth. In the fourth, the powder cask, with the fowls and the sailcloth. Our provisions filled the fifth. In the sixth, our heedless Jack, ten years old, enterprising, bold, and useful. In the seventh, Ernest, twelve years of age, well-informed and rational, but somewhat selfish and indolent. In the eighth, myself, an anxious father, charged with the important duty of guiding the vessel to save my dear family. Each of us had some useful tools beside us. Each held an oar, and had a swimming apparatus at hand, in case we were unfortunately upset. The tide was rising when we left which I considered might assist my weak endeavors. We turned our outriggers lengthwise, and thus passed from the cleft of the ship into the open sea. We rowed with all our might to reach the blue land we saw at a distance, but for some time in vain, as the boat kept turning round and made no progress. At last I contrived to steer it, so that we went straight forward. As soon as our dogs saw us depart, they leaped into the sea and followed us. I could not let them get into the boat, for fear they should upset it. I was very sorry, for I hardly expected they would be able to swim to land, but by occasionally resting their forepaws on our outriggers, they managed to keep up with us. Turk was an English dog, and Flora of a Danish breed. We proceeded slowly, but safely. The nearer we approached the land, the more dreary and unpromising it appeared. The rocky coast seemed to announce to us nothing but famine and misery. The waves, gently rippling against the shore, were scattered over with barrels, bales, and chests from the wreck. Hoping to secure some good provisions, I called on Fritz for assistance. He held a cord, hammer, and nails, and we managed to seize two hogshead in passing and fastening them with cords to our vessel, drew them safely after us to the shore. As we approached, the coast seemed to improve. The chain of rock was not entire, and Fritz's hawk eye made out some trees, which he declared were the coconut tree. Ernest was delighted at the prospect of eating these nuts, so much larger and better than any grown in Europe. I was regretting not having brought the large telescope from the captain's cabin when Jack produced from his pocket a smaller one, which he offered me with no little pride. This was a valuable acquisition, as I was now enabled to make the requisite observations and direct my course. The coast before us had a wild and desert appearance. It looked better towards the left, but I could not approach that part, for a current which drove us towards the rocky and barren shore. At length we saw near the mouth of a rivulet, a little creek between the rocks, towards which our geese and ducks made, serving us for guides. This opening formed a little bay of smooth water, just deep enough for our boat. I cautiously entered it, and landed at a place where the coast was about the height of our tubs, and the water deep enough to let us approach. The shore spread inland, forming a gentle declivity of a triangular form, the point lost among the rocks, and the base to the sea. All that were able leaped on shore in a moment. Even little Francis, who had been laid down in his tub like a salted herring, tried to crawl out, but was compelled to wait for his mother's assistance. The dogs, who had preceded us in landing, welcomed us in a truly friendly manner, leaping playfully around us. The geese kept up a loud cackling, to which the yellow-billed ducks quacked a powerful bass. This, with the clacking of the liberated fowls and the chattering of the boys, 
formed a perfect babble. Mingled with these were the harsh cries of the penguins and flamingos, which hovered over our heads or sat in the points of the rocks. They were in immense numbers, and their notes almost deafened us, especially as they did not accord with the harmony of our civilized fowls. However, I rejoiced to see these feathered creatures, already fancying them on my table, if we were obliged to remain in this desert region. Our first care, when we stepped in safety on land, was to kneel down and thank God, to whom we owed our lives, and to resign ourselves wholly to his fatherly kindness. We then began to unload our vessel. How rich we thought ourselves with the little we had saved! We sought a convenient place for our tent, under the shade of the rocks. We then inserted a pole in a fissure in the rock. This, resting firmly on another pole fixed in the ground, formed the frame of the tent. The sailcloth was then stretched over it, and fastened down at proper distances, by pegs, to which, for greater security, we added some boxes of provision. We fixed some hooks to the canvas at the opening in front, that we might close the entrance during the night. I sent my sons to seek some moss and withered grass, and spread it in the sun to dry to form our beds. And while all, even little Francis, were busy with this, I constructed a sort of cooking place at some distance from the tent, near the river which was to supply us with fresh water. It was merely a hearth of flat stones from the bed of the stream, fenced round with some thick branches. I kindled a cheerful fire with some dry twigs, put on the pot, filled with water and some squares of portable soup, and left my wife, with Francis for assistant, to prepare dinner. He took the portable soup for glue, and could not conceive how Mama could make soup, as we had no meat, and there were no butcher shops here. Fritz, in the meantime, had loaded our guns. He took one to the side of the river, Ernest declined accompanying him, as the rugged road was not to his taste. He preferred the seashore. Jack proceeded to a ridge of rocks on the left, which ran towards the sea, to get some mussels. I went to try and draw the two floating hogsheads on shore, but could not succeed, for our landing place was too steep to get them up. Whilst I was vainly trying to find a more favourable place, I heard my dear Jack uttering most alarming cries. I seized my hatchet, and ran to his assistance. I found him up to the knees in a shallow pool, with a large lobster holding his leg in its sharp claws. It made off at my approach, but I was determined it should pay for the fright it had given me. Cautiously taking it up, I brought it out, followed by Jack, who, now very triumphant, wished to present it himself to his mother, after watching how I held it. But he had hardly got it into his hands when it gave him such a violent blow on the cheek with its tail that he let it fall and began to cry again. I could not help laughing at him, and in his rage he seized a stone and put an end to his adversary. I was grieved at this, and recommended him never to act in a moment of anger showing him that it was unjust in being so revengeful, for if he had been bitten by the lobster, it was plain he would have eaten his foe if he had conquered him. Jack promised to be more discreet and merciful in future, and obtained leave to bear the prize to his mother. Mama, said he proudly, a lobster, a lobster, Ernest, where's Fritz? Take care it doesn't bite you, Francis. They all crowded round in astonishment. Yes, added he, triumphantly, here is the impertinent claw that seized me, but I repaid the knave. You are a boaster, said I. You would have got indifferently on with the lobster if I had not come up, and have you forgotten the slap on the cheek which compelled you to release him? Besides, he only defended himself with his natural arms, but you had to take a great stone. You have no reason to be proud, Jack." Ernest wished to have the lobster added to the soup to improve it, but his mother, with a spirit of economy, reserved it for another day. I then walked to the spot where Jack's lobster was caught, and finding it favorable for my purpose, drew my two hogsheads on shore there, and secured them by turning them on end. On returning, I congratulated Jack on being the first to have been successful in foraging. Ernest remarked, 
that he had seen some oysters attached to a rock, but could not get at them without wetting his feet, which he did not like. "'Indeed, my delicate gentleman,' said I, laughing, "'I must trouble you to return and procure us some. We must all unite in working for the public good, regardless of wet feet. The sun will soon dry us.' I might as well bring some salt at the same time, said he. I saw plenty in the fissures of the rocks left by the sea, I should think, Papa. Doubtless, Mr. Reasoner, replied I. Where else could it have come from? The fact was so obvious that you had better have brought a bagful, than delayed to reflect about it. But if you wish to escape insipid soup, be quick and procure some. He went, and returned with some salt, so mixed with sand and earth, that I should have thrown it away as useless, but my wife dissolved it in fresh water, and, filtering it through a piece of canvas, managed to flavor our soup with it. Jack asked why we could not have used sea water, and I explained to him that the bitter and nauseous taste of sea water would have spoiled our dinner. My wife stirred the soup with a little stick, and, tasting it, pronounced it very good, but added, We must wait for Fritz, and how shall we eat our soup without plates or spoons. We cannot possibly raise this large boiling pot to our heads and drink out of it. It was too true. We gazed stupefied at our pot, and at last all burst into laughter at our destitution and our folly in forgetting such useful necessaries. If we only had coconuts, said Ernest, we might split them and make basins and spoons. If, replied I, but we have none. We might as well wish for a dozen handsome silver spoons at once, if wishes were of any use. But, observed he, we can use oyster shells. A useful thought, Ernest. Go directly and get the oysters. And remember, gentlemen, no complaints, though the spoons are without handles, and you should dip your fingers into the bowl. Off ran Jack, and was mid-leg in the water before Ernest got to him. He tore down the oysters and threw them to his idle brother, who filled his handkerchief, taking care to put a large one into his pocket for his own use, and they returned with their spoil. Fritz had not yet appeared, and his mother was becoming uneasy, when we heard him cheerfully hailing us at a distance. He soon came up with a feigned air of disappointment, and his hands behind him, but Jack, who had glided around him, cried out, a sucking pig, a sucking pig! And he then, with great pride and satisfaction, produced his booty, which I recognized, from the description of travelers, to be the agouti, common in these regions, a swift animal, which burrows in the earth, and lives on fruits and nuts. Its flesh, something like that of the rabbit, has an unpleasant flavor to Europeans. All were anxious to know the particulars of the chase but I seriously reproved my son for his little fiction, and warned him never to use the least deceit, even in jest. I then inquired where he had met with the agouti. He told me he had been on the other side of the river. A very different place to this, continued he. The shore lies low, and you can have no idea of the number of casks, chests, planks, and all sorts of things the sea has thrown up. Shall we go and take possession of them? And tomorrow, father, we ought to make another trip to the vessel to look after our cattle. We might at least bring away the cow. Our biscuit would not be so hard dipped in milk. And very much nicer, added the greedy Ernest. Then, continued Fritz, beyond the river there is rich grass for pasturage, and a shady wood. Why should we remain in this barren wilderness? Softly, replied I, there is a time for all things. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow will have their work. But first tell me, did you see anything of our shipmates? Not a trace of man living or dead, on land or sea. But I saw an animal more like a hog than this, but with feet like a hare. It leaped among the grass, sometimes sitting upright and rubbing its mouth with its forepaws, sometimes seeking for roots and gnawing them like a squirrel. If I had not been afraid it would escape me, I would have tried to take it alive, it seemed so very tame. As we were talking, Jack had been trying with many grimaces to force an oyster open with his knife. I laughed at his vain endeavors, 
and putting some on the fire, showed him them open of themselves. I had no taste for oysters myself, but as they are everywhere accounted a delicacy, I advised my sons to try them. They all at first declined the unattractive repast, except Jack, who, with great courage, closed his eyes and desperately swallowed one as if it had been medicine. The rest followed his example, and then all agreed with me that oysters were not good. The shells were soon plunged into the pot to bring out some of the good soup, but scalding their fingers, it was who could cry out the loudest. Ernest took his large shell from his pocket, cautiously filled it with a good portion of soup, and set it down to cool, exulting in his own prudence. "'You have been very thoughtful, my dear Ernest,' said I. "'But why are your thoughts always for yourself, so seldom for others? As a punishment for your egotism, that portion must be given to our faithful dogs. We can all dip our shells into the pot. The dogs cannot. Therefore they shall have your soup, and you must wait and eat as we do.' My reproach struck his heart, and he placed his shell obediently on the ground, which the dogs emptied immediately. We were almost as hungry as they were, and were watching anxiously till the soup began to cool, when we perceived that the dogs were tearing and gnawing Fritz's agouti. The boys all cried out. Fritz was in a fury, took his gun, struck the dogs, called them names, threw stones at them, and would have killed them if I had not held him. He had actually bent his gun with striking them. As soon as he would listen to me, I reproached him seriously for his violence, and represented to him how much he had distressed us and terrified his mother, that he had spoiled his gun, which might have been so useful to us, had it almost killed the poor animals, who might be more so. Anger, said I, leads to every crime. Remember Cain, who killed his brother in a fit of passion. "'Oh, father!' said he in a voice of terror, and, acknowledging his error, he asked pardon and shed bitter tears. Soon after our repast the sun set, and the fowls gathered round us, and picked up the scattered crumbs of biscuit. My wife then took out her mysterious bag and drew from it some handsfuls of grain to feed her flock. She showed me also many other seeds of useful vegetables. I praised her prudence, and begged her to be very economical, as these seeds were of great value, and we could bring from the vessel some spoiled biscuit for the fowls. Our pigeons now flew among the rocks, the cocks and hens perched on the frame of the tent, and the geese and ducks chose to roost in a marsh covered with bushes near the sea. We prepared for our rest, we loaded all our arms, then offered up our prayers together thanking God for his signal mercy to us, and commending ourselves to his care. When the last ray of light departed, we closed our tent, and lay down on our beds close together. The children had remarked how suddenly the darkness came on, from which I concluded we were not far from the equator, for I explained to them the more perpendicularly the rays of the sun fall, the less their refraction and consequently night comes on suddenly when the sun is below the horizon. Once more I looked out to see if all was quiet, then carefully closing the entrance I lay down. Warm as the day had been, the night was so cold that we were obliged to crowd together for warmth. The children soon slept, and when I saw their mother in her first peaceful sleep, my own eyes closed, and our first night on the island passed comfortably. End of chapter. Chapter 3 At break of day I was waked by the crowing of the cock. I summoned my wife to council, to consider on the business of the day. We agreed that our first duty was to seek for our shipmates, and to examine the country beyond the river before we came to any decisive resolution. My wife saw we could not all go on this expedition, and courageously agreed to remain with her three youngest sons, while Fritz, as the eldest and boldest, should accompany me. I begged her to prepare breakfast immediately, which she warned me would be scanty, as no soup was provided. I asked for Jack's lobster, but it was not to be found. Whilst my wife made the fire and put on the pot, 
I called the children, and asking Jack for the lobster, he brought it from a crevice in the rock where he had hidden it from the dogs, he said, who did not despise anything eatable. "'I am glad to see you profit by the misfortunes of others,' said I. "'And now will you give up that large claw that caught your leg, and which I promised you, to Fritz, as a provision for his journey?' All were anxious to go on this journey, and leaped around me like little kids, but I told them we could not all go. They must remain with their mother, with Flora for a protector. Fritz and I would take Turk. With him and a loaded gun, I thought we should inspire respect. I then ordered Fritz to tie up Flora, and get the guns ready. Fritz blushed, and tried in vain to straighten his crooked gun. I let him go on for some time and then allowed him to take another, for I saw he was penitent. The dogs, too, snarled, and would not let him approach them. He wept, and begged some biscuit from his mother, declaring he would give up his own breakfast to make his peace with the dogs. He fed them, caressed them, and seemed to ask pardon. The dog is always grateful. Flora soon licked his hands. Turk was more unrelenting, appearing to distrust him. "'Give him a claw of the lobster,' said Jack, "'for I make you a present of the whole for your journey.' "'Don't be too uneasy about them,' said Ernest. "'They will certainly meet with coconuts, as Robinson did, "'very different food to your wretched lobster. "'Think of an almond as big as my head, "'with a large cup full of rich milk.' "'Pray, brother, bring me one if you find any,' said Francis. "'We began our preparation. "'We each took a game bag and a hatchet. I gave Fritz a pair of pistols in addition to his gun, equipped myself in the same way, and took care to carry biscuit and a flask of fresh water. The lobster proved so hard at breakfast that the boys did not object to our carrying off the remainder, and though the flesh is coarse, it is very nutritious. I proposed before we departed to have prayers, and my thoughtless Jack began to imitate the sound of church bells. Ding dong to prayers to prayers ding dong I was really angry and reproved him severely for jesting about sacred things then kneeling down I prayed God's blessing on our undertaking and his pardon for us all especially for him who had now so grievously sinned poor Jack came and kneeled by me weeping and begging for forgiveness from me and from God I embraced him and enjoined him and his brothers to obey their mother. I then loaded the guns I left with them, and charged my wife to keep near the boat their best refuge. We took leave of our friends with many tears, as we did not know what dangers might assail us in an unknown region. But the murmur of the river, which we were now approaching, drowned the sound of their sobs, and we bent our thoughts on our journey. The bank of the river was so steep that we could only reach the bed at one little opening near the sea where we had procured our water, but here the opposite side was guarded by a ridge of lofty perpendicular rocks. We were obliged to ascend the river to a place where it fell over some rocks, some fragments of which having fallen made a sort of stepping stones which enabled us to cross with some hazard. We made our way with difficulty through the high grass withered by the sun, directing our course towards the sea, in hopes of discovering some traces of the boats or the crew. We had scarcely gone a hundred yards when we heard a loud noise and rustling in the grass, which was as tall as we were. We imagined we were pursued by some wild beast, and I was gratified to observe the courage of Fritz, who, instead of running away, calmly turned round and presented its peace. What was our joy when we discovered that the formidable enemy was only our faithful Turk, whom we had forgotten in our distress, and our friends had doubtless dispatched him after us? I applauded my son's presence of mind. A rash act might have deprived us of this valuable friend. We continued our way. The sea lay to our left. On our right, at a short distance, ran the chain of rocks, which were continued from our landing-place, in a line parallel to the sea, the summits clothed with verdure and various trees. Between the rocks and the sea, several little woods extended, even to the shore, to which we kept as close as possible. 
vainly looking out on land or sea for any trace of our crew. Fritz proposed to fire his gun as a signal to them if they should be near us, but I reminded him that this signal might bring the savages round us instead of our friends. He then inquired why we should search after these persons at all, who so unfeelingly abandoned us on the wreck. First, said I, we must not return evil for evil. Besides, they may assist us, or be in need of our assistance. Above all, remember, they could save nothing but themselves. We have got many useful things which they have as much right to as we. But we might be saving the lives of our cattle, said he. We should do our duty better by saving the life of a man, answered I. Besides, our cattle have food for some days, and the sea is so calm there is no immediate danger. We proceeded, and entering a little wood that extended to the sea, we rested in the shade, near a clear stream, and took some refreshment. We were surrounded by unknown birds, more remarkable for brilliant plumage than for the charm of their voice. Fritz thought he saw some monkeys among the leaves, and Turk began to be restless, smelling about, and barking very loud. Fritz was gazing up into the trees, when he fell over a large round substance which he brought to me, observing that it might be a bird's nest. I thought it more likely to be a coconut. The fibrous covering had reminded him of the description he had read of the nests of certain birds, but on breaking the shell we found it was indeed a coconut, but quite decayed and uneatable. Fritz was astonished. Where was the sweet milk that Ernest had talked of? I told him the milk was only in the half-ripe nuts, that it thickened and hardened as the nut ripened, becoming a kernel. This nut had perished from remaining above ground. If it had been in the earth, it would have vegetated and burst the shell. I advised my son to try if he could not find a perfect nut. After some search we found one and sat down to eat it, keeping our own provision for dinner. The nut was somewhat rancid, but we enjoyed it, and then continued our journey. We were some time before we got through the wood, being frequently obliged to clear a road for ourselves through the entangled brushwood with our hatchets. At last we entered the open plain again, and had a clear view before us. The forest still extended about a th stone's throw to our right, and Fritz, who was always on the lookout for discoveries, observed a remarkable tree here and there, which he approached to examine, and he soon called me to see this wonderful tree with wens growing on the trunk. On coming up, I was overjoyed to find this tree, of which there were a great number. It was the gourd tree which bears fruit on the trunk. Fritz asked if these were sponges. I told him to bring me one, and I would explain the mystery. "'There's one,' said he, "'very like a pumpkin, only harder outside.' "'Of this shell,' said I, "'we can make plates, dishes, basins, and flasks. We call it the gourd tree.' Fritz leaped for joy. "'Now my dear mother will be able to serve her soup properly.' I asked him if he knew why the tree bore the fruit on its trunk, or on the thick branches only. He immediately replied that the smaller branches would not bear the weight of the fruit. He asked me if this fruit was eatable. Harmless, I believe, said I, but by no means delicate. Its great value to savage nations consists in the shell, which they use to contain their food, and drink, and even cook in it. Fritz could not comprehend how they could cook in the shell without burning it. I told him the shell was not placed on the fire, but being filled with cold water, and the fish or meat placed in it, red-hot stones are, by degrees, introduced into the water, till it attains sufficient heat to cook the food, without injuring the vessel. We then set about making our dishes and plates. I showed Fritz a better plan for dividing the gourd than with a knife. I tied a string tightly round the nut, struck it with the handle of my knife till an incision was made then tightened it till the nut was separated into two equally sized bowls. Fritz had spoiled his gourd by cutting it irregularly with his knife. 
I advised him to try and make spoons of it, as it would not do for basins now. I told him I had learnt my plan from books of travels. It is the practice of the savages, who have no knives, to use a sort of string made from the bark of trees for this purpose. But how can they make bottles? said he. That requires some preparation, replied I. They tie a bandage round the young gourd near the stalk, so that the part at liberty expands in a round form, and the compressed part remains narrow. They then open the top and extract the contents by putting in pebbles and shaking it. By this means they have a complete bottle. We worked on. Fritz completed a dish and some plates to his great satisfaction. But we considered that, being so frail, we could not carry them with us. We therefore filled them with sand, that the sun might not warp them, and left them to dry till we returned. As we went on, Fritz amused himself with cutting spoons from the rind of the gourd, and I tried to do the same with the fragments of the coconut, but I must confess my performances were inferior to those I had seen in the museum in London, the work of the South Sea Islanders. We laughed at our spoons, which would have required mouths from ear to ear to eat with them. Fritz declared that the curve of the rind was the cause of that defect. If the spoons had been smaller, they would have been flat, and you might as well eat soup with an oyster shell as with a shovel. While we talked, we did not neglect looking about for our lost companions, but in vain. At last, we arrived at a place where a tongue of land ran to some distance into the sea, on which was an elevated spot favorable for observation. We attained the summit with great labor, and saw before us a magnificent prospect of land and water, but with all the aid our excellent telescope gave us, we could in no direction discover any trace of man. Nature only appeared in her greatest beauty. The shore enclosed a large bay, which terminated on the other side in a promontory. The gentle rippling of the waves, the varied verdure of the woods, and the multitude of novelties around us would have filled us with delight, but for the painful recollection of those who, we now were compelled to believe, were buried beneath that glittering water. We did not feel less, however, the mercy of God, who had preserved us, and given us a home, with a prospect of subsistence and safety. We had not yet met with any dangerous animals, nor could we perceive any huts of savages. I remarked to my son, that God seemed to have destined us to a solitary life in this rich country, unless some vessel should reach these shores. And his will be done, added I. It must be for the best. Now, let us return to that pretty wood to rest ourselves, and eat our dinner before we return. We proceeded towards a pleasant wood of palm trees, but before reaching it, had to pass through an immense number of reeds, which greatly obstructed our road. We were, moreover, fearful of treading on the deadly serpents who choose such retreats. We made Turk walk before us to give notice, and I cut a long, thick cane as a weapon of defense. I was surprised to see a glutinous juice oozing from the end of the cut cane. I tasted it, and was convinced that we had met with a plantation of sugar canes. I sucked more of it, and found myself singularly refreshed. I said nothing to Fritz, that he might have the pleasure of making the discovery himself. He was walking a few paces before me, and I called him to cut himself a cane like mine, which he did, and soon found out the riches it contained. He cried out in ecstasy, Oh, Papa, Papa, syrup of sugar cane, delicious! How delighted will dear Mama and my brothers be when I carry some to them! He went on, sucking pieces of cane so greedily, that I checked him, recommending moderation. He was then content to take some pieces to regale himself, as he walked home, loading himself with a huge burden for his mother and brothers. We now entered the wood of palms to eat our dinner, when suddenly a number of monkeys, alarmed by our approach, and the barking of the dog, fled like lightning to the tops of the trees, 
and then grinned frightfully at us, with loud cries of defiance. As I saw the trees were cocoa palms, I hoped to obtain, by means of the monkeys, a supply of the nuts in the half-ripe state when filled with milk. I held Fritz's arm, who was preparing to shoot at them, to his great vexation, as he was irritated against the poor monkeys for their derisive gestures. But I told him, though no patron of monkeys myself, I could not allow it. We had no right to kill any animal except in defense, or as a means of supporting life. Besides, the monkeys would be of more use to us living than dead, as I would show him. I began to throw stones at the monkeys, not being able, of course, to reach the place of their retreat, and they, in their anger and in the spirit of imitation, gathered the nuts and hurled them on us in such quantities that we had some difficulty in escaping from them. We had soon a large stock of coconuts. Fritz enjoyed the success of the stratagem, and when the shower subsided, he collected as many as he wished. We then sat down and tasted some of the milk through the three small holes which we opened with our knives. We then divided some with our hatchets, and quenched our thirst with a liquor, which is not, however, a very agreeable flavor. We liked best a sort of thick cream which adheres to the shells, from which we scraped it with our spoons, and mixing it with the juice of the sugar cane, we produced a delicious dish. Turk had the rest of the lobster, which we now despised with some biscuit. We then got up, I tied some nuts together by their stems, and threw them over my shoulder. Fritz took his bundle of canes, and we set out homewards. End of chapter. Chapter 4 Fritz groaned heavily under the weight of his canes as we travelled on, and pitied the poor negroes who had to carry such heavy burdens of them. He then, in imitation of me, tried to refresh himself by sucking a sugar cane, but was surprised to find he failed in extracting any of the juice. At last, after some reflection, he said, Ah, I remember. If there is no opening made for the air, I can get nothing out. I requested him to find a remedy for this. I will make an opening, said he, above the first knot in the cane. If I draw in my breath in sucking, and thus make a vacuum in my mouth, the outer air then forces itself through the hole I have made to fill this vacuum, and carries the juice along with it, and when this division of the cane is emptied, I can proceed to pierce above the next knot. I am only afraid that going on this way we shall have nothing but empty canes to carry to our friends. I told him that I was more afraid the sun might turn the syrup sour before we got our canes home. Therefore we need not spare them. Well, at any rate, said he, I have filled my flask with the milk of the coconut to regale them. I told him I feared another disappointment, for the milk of the coconut, removed from the shell, spoiled sooner than the sugar cane juice. I warned him that the milk, exposed to the sun in his tin flask, was probably become vinegar. He instantly took the bottle from his shoulder and uncorked it when the liquor flew out with a report, foaming like champagne. I congratulated him on his new manufacture, and said we must beware of intoxication. "'Oh, taste, Papa,' he said. "'It is delicious, not at all like vinegar, but capital new, sweet, sparkling wine. This will be the best treat if it remains in this state.' "'I fear it will not be so,' said I. "'This is the first stage of fermentation.' When this is over, and the liquor is cleared, it is a sort of wine, or fermented liquor, more or less agreeable, according to the material used. By applying heat, a second and slower fermentation succeeds, and the liquor becomes vinegar. Then comes on a third stage, which deprives it of its strength, and spoils it. I fear, in this burning climate, you will carry home only vinegar, or something still more offensive. But let us drink each other's health now, but prudently, or we shall soon feel the effects of this potent beverage. Perfectly refreshed, we went on cheerfully to the place where we had left our gourd utensils. We found them quite dry, and hard as bone. We had no difficulty in carrying them in our game bags. We had scarcely got through the little wood where we had breakfasted, 
when Turk darted furiously on a troop of monkeys who were sporting about, and had not perceived him. He immediately seized a female, holding a young one in her arms, which impeded her flight, and had killed and devoured the poor mother before we could reach him. The young one had hidden itself among the long grass, when Fritz arrived. He had run with all his might, losing his hat, bottle, and canes, but could not prevent the murder of the poor mother. The little monkey no sooner saw him than it leaped upon his shoulders, fastening its paws in his curls, and neither cries, threats, nor shaking could rid him of it. I ran up to him laughing, for I saw the little creature could not hurt him, and tried in vain to disengage it. I told him he must carry it thus. It was evident the sagacious little creature, having lost its mother, had adopted him for a father. I succeeded in last in quietly releasing him, and took the little orphan, who was no bigger than a cat, in my arms, pitying its helplessness. The mother appeared as tall as Fritz. I was reluctant to add another mouth to the number we had to feed, but Fritz earnestly begged to keep it offering to divide his share of coconut milk with it till we had our cows. I consented, on condition that he took care of it and taught it to be obedient to him. Turk, in the meantime, was feasting on the remains of the unfortunate mother. Fritz would have driven him off, but I saw we had not food sufficient to satisfy this voracious animal, and we might ourselves be in danger from his appetite. We left him, therefore, with his prey a little orphan sitting on the shoulder of its protector, while I carried the canes. Turk soon overtook us, and was received very coldly. We reproached him with his cruelty, but he was quite unconcerned, and continued to walk after Fritz. The little monkey seemed uneasy at the sight of him, and crept into Fritz's bosom, much to his inconvenience. But a thought struck him. He tied the monkey with a cord to Turk's back, leading the dog by another cord, as he was very rebellious at first. But our threats and caresses at last induced him to submit to his burden. We proceeded slowly, and I could not help anticipating the mirth of my little ones when they saw us approach like a pair of showmen. I advised Fritz not to correct the dogs for attacking and killing unknown animals. Heaven bestows the dog on man, as well as the horse, for a friend and protector. Fritz thought we were very fortunate, then, in having two such faithful dogs. He only regretted that our horses had died on the passage, and only left us the ass. "'Let us not disdain the ass,' said I. "'I wish we had him here. He is of a very fine breed, and would be as useful as a horse to us.' In such conversations, we arrived at the banks of our river before we were aware. Flora barked to announce our approach, and Turk answered so loudly that the terrified little monkey leaped from his back to the shoulder of its protector, and would not come down. Turk ran off to meet his companion, and our dear family soon appeared on the opposite shore, shouting with joy at our happy return. We crossed at the same place as we had done in the morning, and embraced each other. Then began such a noise of exclamations. A monkey! A real live monkey! Oh, how delightful! How glad we are! How did you catch him? He's very ugly, said little Francis, who was almost afraid of him. He's prettier than you are, said Jack. See how he laughs! How I should like to see him eat! If we only had some coconuts, said Ernest, have you found any, and are they good? "'Have you had any unpleasant adventures?' asked my wife. It was in vain to attempt replying to so many questions and exclamations. At length, when we had got a little peace, I told them that, though I had brought them all sorts of good things, I had unfortunately not met with any of our companions. "'God's will be done,' said my wife. "'Let us thank him for saving us, and again bringing us together now. This day has seemed an age.' But put down your loads, and let us hear your adventures. We have not been idle, but we are less fatigued than you. Boys, assist your father and brother. Jack took my gun, Ernest the coconuts, Francis the gourd rinds, and my wife the game bag. Fritz distributed his sugar canes and placed the monkey on Turk's back, to the amusement of the children. He begged Ernest to carry his gun, 
but he complained of being overloaded with the great bowls. His indulgent mother took them from him, and we proceeded to the tent. Fritz thought Ernest would not have relinquished the bowls, if he had known what they contained, and called out to tell him they were coconuts. "'Give them to me!' cried Ernest. "'I will carry them, Mama, and the gun, too!' His mother declined giving them. "'I can throw away these sticks,' said he, "'and carry the gun in my hand.' "'I would advise you not,' observed Fritz, "'for the sticks are sugar-canes.' "'Sugar-canes!' cried they all, surrounding Fritz, who had to give them the history and teach them the art of sucking the canes. My wife, who had a proper respect for sugar in her housekeeping, was much pleased with this discovery, and the history of all our acquisitions, which I displayed to her. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as our plates and dishes, which were actual necessaries. We went to our kitchen, and were gratified to see preparations going on for a good supper. My wife had planted a forked stick on each side of the hearth. On these rested a long, thin wand, on which all sorts of fish were roasting, Francis being entrusted to turn the spit. On the other side was impaled a goose on another spit, and a row of oyster shells formed the dripping pan. Besides this, the iron pot was on the fire, from which arose the savory odor of a good soup. Behind the hearth stood one of the hogsheads, opened, and containing the finest Dutch cheeses, enclosed in cases of lead. All this was very tempting to hungry travelers, and very unlike a supper on a desert island. I could not think my family had been idle when I saw such a result of their labors. I was only sorry that they had killed the goose, as I wished to be economical with our poultry. "'Have no uneasiness,' said my wife. "'This is not from our poultry yard. It is a wild goose killed by Ernest.' "'It is a sort of penguin, I believe,' said Ernest, "'distinguished by the name of Booby, and so stupid that I knocked it down with a stick. "'It is web-footed, has a long, narrow beak, a little curve downwards. "'I have preserved the head and neck for you to examine. "'It exactly resembles the penguin of my book of natural history.' "'I pointed out to him the advantages of study, "'and was making more inquiries about the form and habits of the bird when my wife requested me to defer my catechism of natural history. "'Ernest has killed the bird,' added she. "'I received it. We shall eat it. What more would you have? Let the poor child have the pleasure of examining and tasting the coconuts.' "'Very well,' replied I. "'Fritz must teach them how to open them, and we must not forget the little monkey who has lost his mother's milk.' "'I've tried him,' cried Jack. "'He will eat nothing.' I had told them he had not yet learnt to eat, and we must feed him with coconut milk till we could get something better. Jack generously offered all his share, but Ernest and Francis were anxious to taste the milk themselves. "'But the monkey must live,' said Jack petulantly. "'And so must we all,' said Mother. "'Supper is ready, and we will reserve the coconuts for dessert.' We sat down on the ground and the supper was served on our gourd rind service, which answered the purpose admirably. My impatient boys had broken the nuts, which they found excellent, and they made themselves spoons of the shell. Jack had taken care the monkey had his share. They dipped the corner of their handkerchiefs in the milk and let him suck them. They were going to break up some more nuts after emptying them through the natural holes, but I stopped them and called for a saw. I carefully divided the nuts with this instrument, and soon provided us each with a neat basin for our soup, to the great comfort of my dear wife, who was gratified by seeing us able to eat like civilized beings. Fritz begged now to enliven the repast by introducing his champagne. I consented, requesting him, however, to taste it himself before he served it. What was his mortification to find it vinegar? but we consoled ourselves by using it as sauce to our goose, a great improvement also to the fish. We had now to hear the history of our supper. Jack and Francis had caught the fish at the edge of the sea. My active wife had performed the most laborious duty, in rolling the hogshead to the place and breaking open the head. The sun was going down as we finished supper, and recollecting how rapidly night succeeded, we hastened to our tent, 
where we found our beds much more comfortable from the kind attention of the good mother, who had collected a large addition of dried grass. After prayers, we all lay down, the monkey between Jack and Fritz, carefully covered with moss to keep him warm. The fowls went to their roost, as on the previous night, and after our fatigue we were all soon in a profound sleep. We had not slept long when a great commotion among the dogs and fowls announced the presence of an enemy. My wife, Fritz, and I, each seizing a gun, rushed out. By the light of the moon we saw a terrible battle going on. Our brave dogs were surrounded by a dozen jackals. Three or four were extended dead, but our faithful animals were nearly overpowered by numbers when we arrived. I was glad to find nothing worse than jackals. Fritz and I fired on them. Two fell dead, and the others fled slowly, evidently wounded. Turk and Flora pursued and completed the business, and then, like true dogs, devoured their fallen foes, regardless of the bonds of relationship. All being quiet again, we retired to our beds, Fritz obtaining leave to drag the jackal he had killed towards the tent to save it from the dogs, and to show to his brothers next morning. This he accomplished with difficulty, for it was as big as a large dog. We all slept peacefully the remainder of the night, till the crowing of the cock awoke my wife and myself to a consultation on the business of the day. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Well, my dear, I began, I feel rather alarmed at all the labors I see before me. A voyage to the vessel is indispensable, if we wish to save our cattle, and many other things that may be useful to us. On the other hand, I should like to have a more secure shelter for ourselves and our property than this tent. With patience, order, and perseverance, all may be done, said my good counsellor. And whatever uneasiness your voyage may give me, I yield to the importance and utility of it. Let it be done to-day, and have no care for the morrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, as our blessed Lord has said. It was then agreed that the three youngest children should remain with my wife, and Fritz, the strongest and most active, should accompany me. I then arose, and woke my children from the important duties of the day. Fritz jumped up the first, and ran for his jackal, which had stiffened in the cold of the night. He placed it on all four legs, at the entrance of the tent, to surprise his brothers, but no sooner did the dogs see it erect than they flew at it, and would have torn it to pieces if he had not soothed them and called them off. However, their barking effectually roused the boys, who rushed out to see the cause. Jack issued first with a monkey on his shoulder, but no sooner did the little creature see the jackal than he sprang into the tent and hid himself among the moss, till only the tip of his nose was visible. All were astonished to see this large yellow animal standing. Francis thought it was a wolf. Jack said it was only a dead dog, and Ernest, in a pompous tone, pronounced it to be a golden fox. Fritz laughed at the learned professor who knew the agouti immediately, and now called a jackal a golden fox. "'I judged by the peculiar characteristics,' said Ernest, examining it carefully. "'Oh, the characteristics!' said Fritz ironically. "'Don't you think it may be a golden wolf?' "'Pray don't be so cross, brother,' said Ernest, with tears in his eyes. "'Perhaps you would not have known the name if Papa had not told you.' I reproved Fritz for his ridicule of his brother, and Ernest for so easily taking offence. And to reconcile all, I told them that the jackal partook of the nature of the wolf, the fox, and the dog. This discussion terminated, I summoned them to prayers, after which we thought of breakfast. We had nothing but biscuit, which was certainly dry and hard. Fritz begged for a little cheese with it and Ernest, who was never satisfied like other people, took a survey of the unopened hogshead. He soon returned, crying, "'If we only had a little butter with our biscuit, it would be so good, Papa!' I allowed it would be good, but it was no use thinking of such a thing. "'Let us open the other cask,' said he, displaying a piece of butter he had extracted through a small crack in the side. 
"'Your instinct for good things has been fortunate for us,' said I. "'Come, boys, who wants bread and butter?' We began to consider how we should come at the contents of the hogshead, without exposing the perishable matter to the heat of the sun. Finally, I pierced a hole in the lower part of the cask, large enough for us to draw out the butter as we wanted it, by means of a little wooden shovel which I soon made. We then sat down to breakfast with a coconut basin filled with good salt Dutch butter. We toasted our biscuit, buttered it hot, and agreed it was excellent. Our dogs were sleeping by us as we breakfasted, and I remarked that they had bloody marks in the last night's fray, and some deep and dangerous wounds, especially about the neck. My wife instantly dressed the wounds with butter, well washed in cold water, and the poor animals seemed grateful for the ease it gave them. Ernest judiciously remarked that they ought to have spiked collars to defend them against any wild beasts they might encounter. "'I will make them collars,' said Jack, who never hesitated at anything. I was glad to employ his inventive powers, and, ordering my children not to leave their mother during our absence, but to pray to God to bless our undertaking, we began our preparations for the voyage. While Fritz made ready the boat, I erected a signal post with a piece of sailcloth for a flag to float as long as all was going on well. But if we were wanted, they were to lower the flag and fire a gun three times, when we should immediately return, for I had informed my dear wife it might be necessary for us to remain on board all night, and she consented to the plan, on my promising to pass the night in our tubs instead of the vessel. We took nothing but our guns and ammunition, relying on the ship's provisions. Fritz would, however, take the monkey, that he might give it some milk from the cow. We took a tender leave of each other, and embarked. When we had rowed into the middle of the bay, I perceived a strong current formed by the water of the river which issued at a little distance, which I was glad to take advantage of to spare our labor. It carried us three parts of our voyage, and we rowed the remainder, and entering the opening in the vessel, we secured our boat firmly and went on board. The first care of Fritz was to feed the animals, who were on deck, and who all saluted us after their fashion, rejoiced to see their friends again, as well as to have their wants supplied. We put the young monkey to a goat, which he sucked with extraordinary grimaces, to our infinite amusement. We then took some refreshment ourselves, and Fritz, to my great surprise, proposed that we should begin by adding a sail to our boat. He said the current which helped us to the vessel could not carry us back, but the wind which blew so strongly against us, and made our rowing so fatiguing, would be of great service if we had a sail. I thanked my counsellor for all his good advice, and we immediately set to the task. I selected a strong pole for a mast, and a triangular sail which was fixed to a yard. We made a hole in a plank to receive the mast, secured the plank on our fourth tub, forming a deck, and then, by aid of a block used to hoist and lower the sails, raised our mast. Finally, two ropes fastened by one end to the yard, and by the other to each extremity of the boat, enabled us to direct the sail at pleasure. Fritz next ornamented the top of the mast with a little red streamer. He then gave our boat the name of Deliverance, and requested it might henceforward be called the little vessel. To complete its equipment, I contrived a rudder, so that I could direct the boat from either end. After signaling to our friends that we should not return that night, we spent the rest of the day in emptying the tubs of the stones that we had used for ballast, and replacing them with useful things, powder and shot, nails and tools of all kinds, pieces of cloth, above all we did not forget knives, forks, spoons, and kitchen utensils, including a roasting jack. In the captain's cabin we found some services of silver, pewter plates and dishes, and a small chest filled with bottles of choice wines. All these we took, as well as a chest of eatables intended for the officer's table, portable soup, Westphalian hams, bologna sausages, etc., 
also some bags of maize, wheat, and other seeds, and some potatoes. We collected all the implements of husbandry we could spare room for, and at the request of Fritz, some hammocks and blankets, two or three handsome guns, and an armful of sabres, swords, and hunting knives. Lastly, I embarked a barrel of sulphur, all the cord and string I could lay my hands on, and a large roll of sailcloth. The sulphur was intended to produce matches with. Our tubs were loaded to the edge. There was barely room left for us to sit, and it would have been dangerous to attempt our return if the sea had not been so calm. Night arrived. We exchanged signals to announce security on sea and land, and after prayers for the dear islanders, we sought our tubs, not the most luxurious of dormitories, but safer than the ship. Fritz slept soundly, but I could not close my eyes thinking of the jackals. I was, however, thankful for the protection they had in the dogs. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 As soon as day broke, I mounted on deck to look through the telescope. I saw my wife looking towards us, and the flag which denoted their safety floating in the breeze. Satisfied on this important point, we enjoyed our breakfast of biscuit, ham, and wine, and then turned our thoughts to the means of saving our cattle. Even if we could contrive a raft, we could never get all the animals to remain still on it. We might venture the huge sow in the water, but the rest of the animals we found would not be able to swim to shore. At last Fritz suggested the swimming apparatus. We passed two hours in constructing them. For the cow and ass it was necessary to have an empty cask on each side, well bound in strong sailcloth, fastened by leather thongs over the back and under each animal. For the rest we merely tied a piece of cork under their bodies, the sow only being unruly and giving us much trouble. We then fastened a cord to the horns or neck of each animal, with a slip of wood at the end for a convenient handle. Luckily. The waves had broken away part of the ship, and left the opening wide enough for the passage of our troop. We first launched the ass into the water, by a sudden push. He swam away after the first plunge, very gracefully. The cow, sheep, and goats followed quickly after. The sow was furious, and soon broke loose from us all, but fortunately reached the shore long before the rest. We now embarked fastening all the slips of wood to the stern of the boat, thus drawing our train after us, and the wind filling our sail carried us smoothly towards the shore. Fritz exulted in his plan, as we certainly could never have rowed our boat loaded as we were. I once more took out my telescope, and was remarking that our party on shore seemed making ready for some excursion, when a loud cry from Fritz filled me with terror. We are lost! We are lost! See, what a monstrous fish! Though pale with alarm, the bold boy had seized his gun, and encouraged by my directions, he fired two balls into the head of the monster, as it was preparing to dart on the sheep. It immediately made its escape, leaving a long red track to prove it was severely wounded. Being freed from our enemy, I now resumed the rudder, and we lowered the sail and rowed to shore. The animals, as soon as the water became low enough, walked out at their own discretion, after we had relieved them from their swimming girdles. We then secured our boat as before, and landed ourselves, anxiously looking round for our friends. We had not long to wait, they came joyfully to greet us, and after our first burst of pleasure, we sat down to tell our adventures in a regular form. My wife was overjoyed to see herself surrounded by these valuable animals and especially pleased that her son Fritz had suggested so many useful plans. We next proceeded to disembark all our treasures. I noticed that Jack wore a belt of yellow skin, in which were placed a pair of pistols, and inquired where he had got his brigand costume. "'I manufactured it myself,' said he. "'And this is not all. Look at the dogs!' The dogs wore each a collar of the same skin as his belt, bristling with long nails, the points outwards, a formidable defense. "'It is my own invention,' said he. "'Only Mama helped me in the sewing.' 
"'But where did you get the leather, the needle, and thread?' inquired I. "'Fritz's jackal supplied the skin,' said my wife, "'and my wonderful bag the rest. "'There is still more to come from it. "'Only say what you want.' Fritz evidently felt a little vexation at his brother's unceremonious appropriation of the skin of the jackal, which displayed itself in the tone in which he exclaimed, holding his nose, "'Keep at a distance, Mr. Skinner. You carry an intolerable smell about with you.' I gave him a gentle hint of his duty in the position of eldest son, and he soon recovered his good humour. However, as the body as well as the skin of the jackal was becoming offensive, they united in dragging it down to the sea, while Jack placed his belt in the sun to dry. As I saw no preparation for supper, I told Fritz to bring the ham, and to the astonishment and joy of all, he returned with a fine Westphalian ham, which we had cut into in the morning. "'I will tell you,' said my wife, "'while we have no supper prepared, but first I will make you an omelette.' And she produced from a basket a dozen turtle's eggs. "'You see,' said Ernest, "'they have all the characteristics of those Robinson Crusoe had in his island. They are white balls, the skin of which resembles moistened parchment.' My wife promised to relate the history of the discovery after supper, and set about preparing her ham and omelette, while Fritz and I proceeded in unloading our cargo, assisted by the useful ass. Supper was now ready. A tablecloth was laid over the butter cask, and spread with the plates and spoons from the ship. The ham was in the middle, and the omelette and cheese at each end, and we made a good meal, surrounded by our subjects the dogs, the fowls, the pigeons, the sheep, and the goats, waiting for our notice. The geese and ducks were more independent, remaining in their marsh, where they lived in plenty on the small crabs which abounded there. After supper, I sent Fritz for a bottle of the captain's canary wine, and then requested my wife to give us her recital. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 I will spare you the history of the first day, said my good Elizabeth, spent in anxiety about you, and attending to the signals. But this morning, being satisfied that all was going right, I sought, before the boys got up, a shady place to rest in, but in vain. I believe this barren shore has not a single tree on it. Then I began to consider on the necessity of searching for a more comfortable spot for our residence, and determined after a slight repast, to set out with my children across the river on a journey of discovery. The day before, Jack had busied himself in skinning the jackal with his knife, sharpened on the rock. Ernest, declining to assist him in his dirty work, for which I reproved him, sorry that any fastidiousness should deter him from a labor of benefit to society. Jack proceeded to clean the skin as well as he was able then procured from the nail chest some long flat-headed nails, and inserted them closely through the long pieces of skin he had cut for collars. He then cut some sailcloth, and made a double lining over the heads of the nails, and finished by giving me the delicate office of sewing them together, which I could not but comply with. His belt he first stretched on a plank, nailing it down, and exposing it to the sun, lest it should shrink in drying. Now, for our journey, we took our game bags and some hunting knives. The boys carried provisions, and I had a large flask of water. I took a small hatchet, and gave Ernest a carbine which might be loaded with ball, keeping his light gun for myself. I carefully secured the opening of the tent with the hooks. Turk went before, evidently considering himself our guide, and we crossed the river with some difficulty. As we proceeded, I could not help feeling thankful that you had so early taught the boys to use firearms properly, as the defense of my youngest boy and myself now depended on the two boys of ten and twelve years of age. When we attained the hill you described to us, I was charmed with the smiling prospect, and for the first time since our shipwreck ventured to hope for better things. I had remarked a beautiful wood, to which I determined to make our way, for a little shade, 
and a most painful progress it was, through grass that was higher than the children's heads. As we were struggling through it, we heard a strange rustling sound among the grass, and at the same moment a bird of prodigious size arose and flew away before the poor boys could get their guns ready. They were much mortified, and I recommended them always to have their guns in readiness, for the birds would not be likely to wait till they loaded them. Francis thought the bird was so large it must be an eagle, but Ernest ridiculed the idea, and added that he thought it must be of the Bustard tribe. We went forward to the spot from which it had arisen, when suddenly another bird of the same kind, though still larger, sprung up close to our feet, and was soon soaring above our heads. I could not help laughing to see the look of astonishment and confusion with which the boys looked upwards after it. At last Jack took off his hat, and making a low bow said, Pray, Mr. Bird, be kind enough to pay us another visit. You will find us very good children. We found the large nest they had left. It was rudely formed of dry grass and empty, but some fragments of eggshells were scattered near, as if the young had just been recently hatched. We therefore concluded that they had escaped among the grass. Dr. Ernest immediately began a lecture. You observe, Francis, these birds could not be eagles, which do not form their nests on the ground. Neither do their young run as soon as they are hatched. These must be of the gallinaceous tribe, an order of birds such as quails, partridges, turkeys, etc., and from the sort of feathered moustache which I observed at the corner of the beak, I should pronounce that these were bustards. And we had now reached the little wood, and our learned friend had sufficient employment in scrutinizing and endeavouring to classify the immense number of beautiful unknown birds which sung and fluttered about us, apparently regardless of our intrusion. We found that what we thought a wood was merely a group of a dozen trees, of a height far beyond any I had ever seen, and apparently belonging rather to the air than the earth, the trunks springing from roots which formed a series of supporting arches. Jack climbed one of the arches, and measured the trunk of the wood with a piece of pack-thread. He found it to be thirty-four feet! I made thirty-two steps round the roots. Between the roots and the lowest branches it seemed about forty or fifty feet. The branches are thick and strong, and the leaves are of a moderate size, and resemble our walnut tree. A thick, short, smooth turf clothed the ground beneath and around the detached roots of the trees, and everything combined to render this one of the most delicious spots the mind could conceive. Here we rested and made our noonday repast. A clear rivulet ran near us, and offered its agreeable waters for our refreshment. Our dogs soon joined us, but I was astonished to find they did not crave for food, but laid down to sleep at our feet. For myself, so safe and happy did I feel, that I could not but think that if we could contrive a dwelling on the branches of one of these trees, we should be in perfect peace and safety. We set out on our return, taking the road by the seashore, in case the waves had cast up anything from the wreck of the vessel. We found a quantity of timber, chests, and casks, but all too heavy to bring. We succeeded in dragging them as well as we could out of the reach of the tide. Our dogs, in the meantime, fishing for crabs, with which they regaled themselves, much to their own satisfaction, and to mine, as I now saw they would be able to provide their own food. As we rested from our rough labor, I saw Flora scratching in the sand and swallowing something with great relish. Ernest watched, and then said very quietly, They are turtle's eggs. We drove away the dog and collected about two dozen, leaving her the rest as a reward for her discovery. While we carefully deposited our spoil in the game-bags, we were astonished at the sight of a sail. Ernest was certain it was Papa and Fritz, and though Francis was in dread that it should be the savages who visited Robinson Crusoe's island coming to eat us up, we were soon enabled to calm his fears. 
we crossed the river by leaping from stone to stone, and hastening to the landing-place, arrived to greet you on your happy return. "'And I understand, my dear,' said I, "'that you have discovered a tree sixty feet high, where you wish we should perch like fowls. But how are we to get up?' "'Oh, you must remember,' answered she, "'the large lime-tree near our native town, in which was a ballroom. We used to ascend to it by wooden staircase. Could you not contrive something of the sort in one of these gigantic trees, where we might sleep in peace, fearing neither jackals nor any other terrible nocturnal enemy? I promised to consider this plan, hoping at least that we might make a commodious and shady dwelling among the roots. Tomorrow we were to examine it. We then performed our evening devotions, and retired to rest. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Now, my dear Elizabeth, said I, waking early next morning, let us talk a little on this grand project of changing our residence, to which there are many objections. First, it seems wise to remain on the spot where Providence has cast us, where we can have at once means of support drawn from the ship, and security from all attacks protected by the rock, the river, and the sea on all sides. My wife distrusted the river, which could not protect us from the jackals, and complained of the intolerable heat of this sandy desert, of her distaste for such food as oysters and wild geese, and lastly, of her agony of mind when we ventured to the wreck, willingly renouncing all its treasures and begging that we might rest content with the blessings we already had. There is some truth in your objections, said I, and perhaps we may erect a dwelling under the roots of your favorite tree. But among these rocks we must have a storehouse for our goods, and a retreat in case of invasion. I hope, by blowing off some pieces of the rock with powder, to be able to fortify the part next the river, leaving a secret passage known only to ourselves. This would make it impregnable. But before we proceed, we must have a bridge to convey our baggage across the river. A bridge, said she in a tone of vexation. Then when shall we get from here? Why cannot we ford it as usual? The cow and ass could carry our stores. I explained to her how necessary it was for our ammunition and provision to be conveyed over without risk of wetting, and begged her to manufacture some bags and baskets and leave the bridge to me and my boys. If we succeeded, it would always be useful. As for fear of danger from lightning or accident, I intended to make a powder magazine among the rocks. The important question was now decided. I called up my sons and communicated our plans to them. They were greatly delighted, though somewhat alarmed, at the formidable project of the bridge. Besides, the delay was vexatious. They were all anxious for removal into the Land of Promise, as they chose to call it. We read prayers, and then thought of breakfast. The monkey sucked one of the goats as if it had been its mother. My wife milked the cow, and gave us boiled milk with biscuit for our breakfast, part of which she put in a flask for us to take on our expedition. We then prepared our boat for a voyage to the vessel, to procure planks and timber for our bridge. I took both Ernest and Fritz, as I foresaw our cargo would be weighty, and require all our hands to bring it to shore. We rowed vigorously till we got into the current, which soon carried us beyond the bay. We had scarcely reached a little isle at the entrance, when we saw a vast number of gulls and other sea-birds fluttering with discordant cries over it. I hoisted the sail, and we approached rapidly and when near enough, we stepped on shore and saw that the birds were feasting so eagerly on the remains of a huge fish that they did not even notice our approach. We might have killed numbers even with our sticks. This fish was the shark which Fritz had so skillfully shot through the head the night before. He found the marks of his three balls. Ernest drew his ramrod from his gun and struck so vigorously right and left among the birds that he killed some and put the rest to flight. We then hastily cut off some pieces of the skin of the monster which I thought might be useful, and placed them in our boat. 
but this was not the only advantage we gained by landing. I perceived an immense quantity of wrecked timber lying on the shore of the island, which would spare us our voyage to the ship. We selected such planks as were fit for our purpose, then, by the aid of our jack-screw and some levers we had brought with us, we extricated the planks from the sand and floated them, and, binding the spars and yards together with cords, with the planks above them like a raft, we tied them to the stern of our boat and hoisted our sail. Fritz, as we sailed, was drying the shark skin, which I hoped to convert into files. And Ernest, in his usual reflective manner, observed to me, What a beautiful arrangement of providence it is, that the mouth of the shark should be placed in such a position that he is compelled to turn on his back to seize his prey, thus giving it a chance of escape, else with his excessive veracity he might depopulate the ocean. At last we reached our landing-place, and securing our boat, and calling out loudly, we soon saw our friends running from the river, each carried a handkerchief filled with some new acquisition, and Francis had over his shoulder a small fishing-net. Jack reached us first, and threw down before us from his handkerchief some fine crawfish. They had each as many, forming a provision for many days. Francis claimed the merit of the discovery. Jack related that Francis and he took a walk to find a good place for the bridge. "'Thank you, Mr. Architect,' said I. "'Then you must superintend the workmen. Have you fixed on your place?' "'Yes, yes,' cried he. "'Only listen. When we got to the river, Francis, who was looking about, called out, "'Jack, Jack! Fritz's jackal is covered with crabs. Come, come!' I ran to tell Mama, who brought a net that came from the ship, and we caught these in a few minutes and could have got many more if you had not come. I commanded them to put the smaller ones back into the river, reserving only as many as we could eat. I was truly thankful to discover another means of support. We now landed our timber. I had looked at Jack's site for the bridge, and thought my little architect very happy in his selection, but it was at a great distance from the timber. I recollected the simplicity of the harness the Laplanders used for their reindeer. I tied cords to the horns of the cow, as the strength of this animal is in the head, and then fastened the other ends round the piece of timber we wanted moving. I placed a halter round the neck of the ass, and attached the cords to this. We were thus enabled, by degrees, to remove all our wood to the chosen spot, where the sides of the river were steep, and appeared of equal height. It was necessary to know the breadth of the river, to select the proper planks, and Ernest proposed to procure a ball of pack-thread from his mother, to tie a stone to one end of the string, and throw it across the river, and to measure it after drawing it back. This expedient succeeded admirably. We found the breadth to be eighteen feet, but as I proposed to give the bridge strength by having three feet at least resting on each shore, we chose some planks of twenty-four feet in length. How we were to get these across the river was another question, which we prepared to discuss during dinner, to which my wife now summoned us. Our dinner consisted of a dish of crawfish and some very good rice milk, but before we began we admired her work. She had made a pair of bags for the ass, sewed with pack thread, but having no large needles she had been obliged to pierce holes with a nail, a tedious and painful process. Well satisfied with her success, we turned to our repast, talking of our bridge, which the boys, by anticipation, named the non-pariah. We then went to work. There happened to be an old trunk of a tree standing on the shore. To this I tied my main beam by a strong cord, loose enough to turn round the trunk. Another cord was attached to the opposite end of the beam, long enough to cross the river twice. I took the end of my rope over the stream, where we had previously fixed the block, used in our boat, to a tree, by the hook which usually suspended it. I passed my rope, and returned with the end to our own side. I then harnessed my cow and ass to the end of my rope, and drove them forcibly from the shore. The beam turned slowly round the trunk, then advanced, and was finally lodged over the river amidst the shouts of the boys, its own weight keeping it firm. 
Fritz and Jack leaped on it immediately to run across, to my great fear. We succeeded in placing four strong beams in the same way, and by the aid of my sons, I arranged them at a convenient distance from each other, that we might have a broad and good bridge. We then laid down planks close together across the beams, but not fixed, as in time of danger it might be necessary rapidly to remove the bridge. My wife and I were as much excited as the children, and ran across with delight. Our bridge was at least ten feet broad. Thoroughly fatigued with our day of labor, we returned home, supped, and offered thanks to God, and went to rest. End of chapter. Chapter 9 The next morning, after prayers, I assembled my family. We took a solemn leave of our first place of refuge. I cautioned my sons to be prudent and on their guard, and especially to remain together during our journey. We then prepared for departure. We assembled the cattle, the bags were fixed across the backs of the cow and the ass, and loaded with all our heavy baggage, our cooking utensils, and provisions consisting of biscuits, butter, cheese, and portable soup, our hammocks and blankets the captain's service of plate, were all carefully packed in the bags, equally poised on each side of the animals. All was ready, when my wife came in haste with her inexhaustible bag, requesting a place for it. Neither would she consent to leave the poultry as food for the jackals. Above all, Francis must have a place he could not possibly walk all the way. I was amused with the exactions of the sex, but consented to all and made a good place for Francis between the bags on the back of the ass. The elder boys returned in despair. They could not succeed in catching the fowls, but the experienced mother laughed at them and said she would soon capture them. If you do, said my pert little Jack, I will be contented to be roasted in the place of the first chicken taken. Then my poor Jack, said his mother, you'll soon be on the spit. Remember that intellect has always more power than mere bodily exertion. Look here. She scattered a few handfuls of grain before the tent, calling the fowls. They soon all assembled, including the pigeons, then throwing down more inside the tent, they followed her. It was now only necessary to close the entrance, and they were all soon taken, tied by the wings and feet, and being placed in baskets covered with nets were added to the rest of our luggage on the backs of the animals. Finally, we conveyed inside the tent all we could not carry away, closing the entrance and barricading it with chests and casks, thus confiding all our possessions to the care of God. We set out on our pilgrimage, each carrying a game bag and a gun. My wife and her eldest son led the way, followed by the heavily laden cow and ass. The third division consisted of the goats driven by Jack, the little monkey seated on the back of its nurse and grimacing to our great amusement. Next came Ernest with the sheep, and I followed, superintending the whole. Our gallant dogs acted as aides de camp, and were continually passing from the front to the rear rank. Our march was slow, but orderly, and quite patriarchal. We are now traveling across the deserts as our first fathers did, said I, and as the Arabs, Tartars, and other nomad nations do to this day, followed by their flocks and herds. But these people generally have strong camels to bear their burdens, instead of a poor ass and cow. I hope this may be the last of our pilgrimages. My wife also hoped that, once under the shade of her marvelous trees, we should have no temptation to travel further. We now crossed our new bridge, and here the party was happily augmented by a new arrival. The sow had proved very mutinous at setting out, and we had been compelled to leave her. She now voluntarily joined us, seeing we were actually departing, but continued to grunt loudly her disapprobation of our proceedings. After we had crossed the river, we had another embarrassment. The rich grass tempted our animals to stray off to feed and, but for our dogs, we should never have been able to master them again. But for fear of further accident, I commanded my advance guard to take the road by the coast, which offered no temptation to our troops. We had scarcely left the high grass when our dogs rushed back into it, barking furiously, 
and howling as if in combat. Fritz immediately prepared for action. Ernest drew near his mother. Jack rushed forward with his gun over his shoulder, and I cautiously advanced, commanding them to be discreet and cool. But Jack, with his usual impetuosity, leaped among the high grass to the dogs, and immediately returned, clapping his hands and crying out, Be quick, papa! A huge porcupine with quills as long as my arm! When I got up, I really found a porcupine, whom the dogs were warmly attacking. It made a frightful noise, erecting its quills so boldly that the wounded animals howled with pain after every attempt to seize it. As we were looking at them, Jack drew a pistol from his belt, and discharged it directly into the head of the porcupine, which fell dead. Jack was very proud of his feet, and Fritz, not a little jealous, suggested that such a little boy should not be trusted with pistols, as he might have shot one of the dogs, or even one of us. I forbade any envy or jealousy among the brothers, and declared that all did well who acted for the public good. Mama was now summoned to see the curious animal her son's valor had destroyed. Her first thought was to dress the wounds made by the quills which had stuck in the noses of the dogs during their attack. In the meantime, I corrected my son's notions on the power of this animal to lance its darts when in danger. Nature has given it a sufficient protection in its defensive and offensive armor. As Jack earnestly desired to carry his booty with him, I carefully embedded the body in soft grass to preserve the quills, then packed it in strong cloth, and placed it on the ass behind Francis. At last we arrived at the end of our journey, and certainly the size of the trees surpassed anything I could have imagined. Jack was certain they were gigantic walnut trees, for my own part. I believed them to be a species of fig tree, probably the Antilles fig. But all thanks were given to the kind mother who had sought out such a pleasant home for us. At all events we could find a convenient shelter among the roots. And if we should ever succeed in perching on the branches, I told her we should be safe from all wild beasts. I would defy even the bears of our native mountains to climb these immense trunks, totally destitute of branches. We released our animals from their loads, tying their forelegs together, that they might not stray, except the cow, who, as usual, did her own way. The fowls and pigeons we released, and left to their own discretion. We then sat down on the grass, to consider where we should establish ourselves. I wished to mount the tree that very night. Suddenly we heard, to our no slight alarm, the report of a gun. But the next moment the voice of Fritz reassured us. He had stolen out unnoticed, and shot a beautiful tiger-cat, which he displayed in great triumph. "'Well done, noble hunter,' said I. "'You deserve the thanks of the fowls and pigeons. They would most probably have all fallen to sacrifice to-night, if you had not slain their deadly foe. Pray wage war with all his kind.' or we shall not have a chicken left for the pot." Ernest then examined the animal with his customary attention, and declared that the proper name was the Margay, a fact Fritz did not dispute, only requesting that Jack might not meddle with the skin, as he wished to preserve it for a belt. I recommended them to skin it immediately, and give the flesh to the dogs. Jack at the same time determined to skin his porcupine to make dog collars. Part of its flesh went into the soup kettle, and the rest was salted for the next day. We then sought for some flat stones in the bed of the charming little river that ran at a little distance from us, and set about constructing a cooking place. Francis collected dry wood for the fire, and while my wife was occupied in preparing our supper, I amused myself by making some packing needles for her rude work from the quills of the porcupine. I held a large nail in the fire till it was red-hot. Then holding the head in wet linen, I pierced the quills, and made several needles, of various sizes, to the great contentment of our indefatigable workwoman. Still occupied with the idea of our castle in the air, I thought of making a ladder of ropes, but this would be useless if we did not succeed in getting a cord over the lower branches to draw it up. Neither my sons nor myself could throw a stone, to which I had fastened a cord, over these branches, 
which were thirty feet above us. It was necessary to think of some other expedient. In the meantime, dinner was ready. The porcupine made excellent soup, and the flesh was well tasted, though rather hard. My wife could not make up her mind to taste it, but contented herself with a slice of ham and some cheese. End of chapter. Chapter 10 After dinner, as I found we could not ascend at present, I suspended our hammocks under the arched roots of our tree, and, covering the hole with sailcloth, we had a shelter from the dew and the insects. While my wife was employed making harness for the cow and ass, I went with my sons to the shore to look for wood fit for our use next day. We saw a great quantity of wreck, but none fit for our purpose, till Ernest met with a heap of bamboo canes half buried in sand and mud. These were exactly what I wanted. I drew them out of the sand, stripped them of their leaves, and cut them in pieces of about four or five feet long, and my sons each made up a bundle to carry home. I then set out to make some slender stalks to make arrows, which I should need in my project. We went towards a thick grove, which appeared likely to contain something for my purpose. We were very cautious, for fear of reptiles or other dangerous animals, allowing Flora to precede us. When we got near, she darted furiously among the bushes, and out flew a troop of beautiful flamingos, and soared into the air. Fritz, always ready, fired at them. Two fell, one quite dead, the other slightly wounded in the wing, made use of its long legs so well that it would have escaped if Flora had not seized it and held it till I came up to take possession. The joy of Fritz was extreme to have this beautiful creature alive. He thought at once of curing its wound and domesticating it with our own poultry. "'What splendid plumage!' said Ernest. "'And you see he is web-footed, like the goose, and has long legs like the stork. Thus he can run as fast on land as he can swim in the water.' Yes, said I, and fly as quickly in the air. These birds are remarkable for the power and strength of their wings. Few birds have so many advantages. My boys occupied themselves in binding their captive and dressing his wound, while I sought some of the canes which had done flowering to cut off the hard ends to point my arrows. These are used by the savages of the Antilles. I then selected the highest canes I could meet with, to assist me in measuring, by a geometrical process, the height of the tree. Ernest took the canes, I had the wounded flamingo, and Fritz carried his own game. Very loud were the cries of joy and astonishment at our approach. The boys all hoped the flamingo might be tamed, of which I felt no doubt, but my wife was uneasy, lest it should require more food than she could spare. However, I assured her our new guest would need no attention as he would provide for himself at the riverside, feeding on small fishes, worms, and insects. His wounds I dressed, and found they would soon be healed. I then tied him to a stake near the river, by a cord long enough to allow him to fish at his pleasure, and in fact, in a few days, he learned to know us, and was quite domesticated. Meantime, my boys had been trying to measure the tree with the long canes I had brought, and came laughing to report to me, that I ought to have got them ten times as long to reach even the lowest branches. There is a simpler mode than that, said I, which geometry teaches us, and by which the highest mountains can be measured. I then showed the method of measuring heights by triangles and imaginary lines, using canes of different lengths and cords instead of mathematical instruments. My result was thirty feet to the lowest branches. This experiment filled the boys with wonder, and desired to become acquainted with this useful exact science, which, happily, I was able to teach them fully. I now ordered Fritz to measure our strong cord, and the little ones to collect all the small string, and wind it. I then took a strong bamboo, and made a bow of it, and some arrows of the slender canes, filling them with wet sand to give them weight, and feathering them from the dead flamingo. As soon as my work was completed, the boys crowded round me, all begging to drive the bow and arrows. I begged them to be patient, and asked my wife to supply me with a ball of thick, strong thread. The enchanted bag did not fail us, 
the very ball I wanted appeared at her summons. This, my little ones declared, must be magic, but I explained to them that prudence, foresight, and presence of mind in danger, such as their good mother had displayed, produced more miracles than magic. I then tied the end of the ball of thread to one of my arrows, fixed it in my bow, and sent it directly over one of the thickest of the lower branches of the tree, and, falling to the ground, it drew the thread after it. Charmed with this result, I hastened to complete my ladder. Fritz had measured our ropes, and found two of forty feet each, exactly what I wanted. These I stretched on the ground at about one foot distance from each other. Fritz cut pieces of cane two feet long, which Ernest passed to me. I placed these in knots which I had made in the cords, at about a foot distance from each other, and Jack fastened each end with a long nail, to prevent it slipping. In a very short time our ladder was completed, and, tying it to the end of the cord which went over the branch, we drew it up without difficulty. All the boys were anxious to ascend, but I chose Jack as the lightest and most active. Accordingly, he ascended, while his brothers and myself held the ladder firm by the end of the cord. Fritz followed him, conveying a bag with nails and hammer. They were soon perched on the branches, huzzahing to us. Fritz secured the ladder so firmly to the branch that I had no hesitation in ascending myself. I carried with me a large pulley fixed to the end of a rope, which I attached to a branch above us to enable us to raise the planks necessary to form the groundwork of our habitation. I smoothed the branches a little by aid of my axe, sending the boys down to be out of my way. After completing my day's work, I descended by the light of the moon, and was alarmed to find that Fritz and Jack were not below, and still more so, when I heard their clear, sweet voices at the summit of the tree singing the evening hymn as if to sanctify our future abode. They had climbed the tree instead of descending, and, filled with wonder and reverence at the sublime view below, had burst out into the hymn of thanksgiving to God. I could not scold my dear boys when they descended, but directed them to assemble the animals and to collect wood to keep up fires during the night in order to drive away any wild beasts that might be near. My wife then displayed her work, complete harness for her two beasts of burden, and in return I promised her we would establish ourselves next day in the tree. Supper was now ready. One piece of the porcupine was roasted by the fire, smelling deliciously. Another piece formed a rich soup. A cloth was spread on the turf. The ham, cheese, butter, and biscuits were placed upon it. My wife first assembled the fowls by throwing some grain to them to accustom them to the place. We soon saw the pigeons fly to roost on the higher branches of the trees, while the fowls perched on the ladder, the beasts we tied to the roots close to us. Now that our cares were over, we sat down to a merry and excellent repast by moonlight. Then, after the prayers of the evening, I kindled our watch-fires, and we all lay down to rest in our hammocks. The boys were rather discontented and complained of their cramped position, longing for the freedom of their beds of moss. But I instructed them to lie, as sailors do, diagonally, and swinging the hammock, and told them that brave Swiss boys might sleep as the sailors of all nations were compelled to sleep. After some stifled sighs and groans, all sank to rest except myself, kept awake by anxiety for the safety of the rest. End of chapter. Chapter 11 My anxiety kept me awake till near morning, when, after a short sleep, I rose, and we were soon all at work. My wife, after milking the cow and goats, harnessed the cow and ass, and set out to search for driftwood for our use. In the meantime, I mounted the ladder with Fritz, and we set to work stoutly, with axe and saw, to rid ourselves of all useless branches. Some about six feet above our foundation I left to suspend our hammocks from, and others a little higher to support the roof, which at present was to be merely sailcloth. My wife succeeded in collecting us some boards and planks, which with her assistance and the aid of the pulley we hoisted up. 
We then arranged them on the level branches close to each other, in such a manner as to form a smooth and solid floor. I made a sort of parapet round, to prevent accidents. By degrees our dwelling began to assume a distinct form. The sailcloth was raised over the high branches, forming a roof, and being brought down on each side, was nailed to the parapet. The immense trunk protected the back of our apartment, and the front was open to admit the breeze from the sea, which was visible from this elevation. We hoisted our hammocks and blankets by the pulley, and suspended them. My son and I then descended, and as our day was not yet exhausted, we set about constructing a rude table and some benches from the remainder of our wood, which we placed beneath the roots of the tree, henceforward to be our dining-room. The little boys collected the chips and pieces of wood for firewood, while their mamma prepared supper, which we needed much after the extraordinary fatigues of this day. The next day, however, being Sunday, we looked forward to as a day of rest, of recreation, and thanksgiving to the great God who had preserved us. Supper was now ready. My wife took a large earthen pot from the fire, which contained a good stew made of the flamingo which Ernest had told her was an old bird and would not be eatable if dressed any other way. His brothers laughed heartily and called him the cook. He was, however, quite right. The stew, well seasoned, was excellent, and we picked the very bones. Whilst we were thus occupied, the living flamingo, accompanying the rest of the fowls, and free from bonds, came in quite tame to claim his share of the repast, evidently quite unsuspicious that we were devouring his mate. He did not seem at all inclined to quit us. The little monkey, too, was quite at home with the boys, leaping from one to another for food, which he took in his forepaws and ate with such absurd mimicry of their actions that he kept us in continual convulsions of laughter. To augment our satisfaction, our great sow, who had deserted us for two days, returned of her own accord, grunting her joy at our reunion. My wife welcomed her with particular distinction, treating her with all the milk we had to spare, for, as she had no dairy utensils to make cheese and butter, it was best thus to dispose of our superfluity. I promised her, on our next voyage to the ship, to procure all these necessaries. This she could not, however, hear of without shuddering. The boys now lighted the fires for the night. The dogs were tied to the roots of the tree, as a protection against invaders, and we commenced our ascent. My three eldest sons soon ran up the ladder. My wife followed, with more deliberation, but arrived safely. My own journey was more difficult, as, besides having to carry Francis on my back, I had detached the lower part of the ladder from the roots, where it was nailed, in order to be able to draw it up during the night. We were thus as safe in our castle as the knights of old when their drawbridge was raised. We retired to our hammocks, free from care, and did not wake till the sun shone brightly in upon us. End of chapter. Chapter 12 Next morning, all awoke in good spirits. I told them that on this, the Lord's day, we would do no work that it was appointed not only for a day of rest, but a day when we must, as much as possible, turn our hearts from the vanities of the world to God Himself, thank Him, worship Him, and serve Him. Jack thought we could not do this without a church and a priest, but Ernest believed that God would hear our prayers under His own sky, and Papa could give them a sermon. Francis wished to know if God would like to hear them sing the beautiful hymns Mama had taught them, without an organ accompaniment. "'Yes, my dear children,' said I, "'God is everywhere, and to bless Him, to praise Him in all His works, to submit to His holy will, and to obey Him, is to serve Him. But everything in its time. Let us first attend to the wants of our animals and breakfast.' and we will then begin the services of the day by a hymn. We descended and breakfasted on warm milk, fed our animals, and then, my children and their mother seated on the turf, I placed myself on a little eminence before them, 
and after the service of the day, which I knew by heart, and singing some portions of the 119th Psalm, I told them a little allegory. There was once on a time a great king, whose kingdom was called the land of light and reality, because there reigned there constant light and incessant activity. On the most remote frontier of this kingdom, towards the north, there was another large kingdom, equally subject to his rule, and of which none but himself knew the immense extent. From time immemorial, an exact plan of this kingdom had been preserved in the archives. It was called the land of obscurity, or night, because everything in it was dark and inactive. In the most fertile and agreeable part of the empire of reality, the king had a magnificent residence called the Heavenly City, where he held his brilliant court. Millions of servants executed his wishes, still more were ready to receive his orders. The first were clothed in glittering robes, whiter than snow, for white was the color of the great king as the emblem of purity. Others were clothed in armor, shining like the colors of the rainbow, and carried flaming swords in their hands. Each, at his master's nod, flew like lightning to accomplish his will. All his servants, faithful, vigilant, bold, and ardent, were united in friendship, and could imagine no happiness greater than the favor of their master. There were some less elevated, who were still good, rich, and happy in the favors of their sovereign, to whom all his subjects were alike, and were treated by him as his children. Not far from the frontiers, the great king possessed a desert island, which he desired to people and cultivate, in order to make it, for a time, the abode of those of his subjects whom he intended to admit by degrees into his heavenly city a favor he wished to bestow on the greatest number possible. This island was called Earthly Abode, and he who had passed some time there, worthily, was to be received into all the happiness of the heavenly city. To attain this, the great king equipped a fleet to transport the colonists, whom he chose from the kingdom of night, to this island, where he gave them light and activity, advantages they had not known before. Think how joyful their arrival would be. The land was fertile when cultivated, and all was prepared to make the time pass agreeably, till they were admitted to their highest honors. At the moment of embarkation, the great king sent his own son, who spoke thus to them in his name. My dear children, I have called you from inaction and insensibility to render you happy by feeling, by action, by life. Never forget I am your king, and obey my commands, by cultivating the country I confide to you. Every one will receive his portion of land, and wise and learned men are appointed to explain my will to you. I wish you all to acquire the knowledge of my laws, and that every father should keep a copy to read daily to his children, that they may never be forgotten. And on the first day of the week, you must all assemble as brothers in one place to hear these laws read and explained. Thus it will be easy for everyone to learn the best method of improving his land, what to plant, and how to cleanse it from the tares that might choke the good seed. All may ask what they desire, and every reasonable demand will be granted, if it be conformable to the great end. If you feel grateful for these benefits, and testify it by increased activity, and by occupying yourself on this day in expressing your gratitude to me, I will take care this day of rest shall be a benefit, and not a loss. I wish that all your useful animals, and even the wild beasts of the plains, should on this day repose in peace. He who obeys my commands in earthly abode shall receive a rich reward in the heavenly city. But the idle, the negligent, and the evil disposed shall be condemned to perpetual slavery or to labor in mines in the bowels of the earth. From time to time, 
I shall send ships to bring away individuals to be rewarded or punished as they have fulfilled my commands. None can deceive me. A magic mirror will show me the actions and thoughts of all. The colonists were satisfied and eager to begin their labor. The portions of land and instruments of labor were distributed to them with seeds and useful plants and fruit trees. They were then left to turn these good gifts to profit. But what followed? Everyone did as he wished. Some planted their ground with groves and gardens, pretty and useless. Others planted wild fruit, instead of the good fruit the great king had commanded. A third had sowed good seed, but not knowing the tares from the wheat, he had torn up all before they reached maturity. But the most part left their land uncultivated. They had lost their seeds, or spoiled their implements. Many would not understand the orders of the great king, and others tried by subtlety to evade them. A few labored with courage, as they had been taught, rejoicing in the hope of the promise given them. Their greatest danger was in the disbelief of their teachers. Though every one had a copy of the law, few read it. All were ready, by some excuse, to avoid this duty. Some asserted they knew it, yet never thought on it. Some called these the laws of past times, not of the present. Others said the great king did not regard the action of his subjects, that he had neither mines nor dungeons, and that all would certainly be taken to the heavenly city. They began to neglect the duties of the day dedicated to the great king. Few assembled, and of these, the most part were inattentive, and did not profit by the instruction given them. But the great king was faithful to his word. From time to time frigates appeared, bearing the name of some disease. These were followed by a large vessel called the Grave, bearing the terrible flag of the Admiral Death. This flag was of two colors, green and black, and appeared to the colonists, according to their state, the smiling color of hope or the gloomy hue of despair. This fleet always arrived unexpectedly and was usually unwelcome. The officers were sent out by the admiral to seize those he pointed out. Many who were unwilling were compelled to go, and others whose land was prepared, and even the harvest ripening were summoned. But these went joyfully, sure that they went to happiness. The fleet being ready, sailed for the heavenly city. Then the great king in his justice awarded the punishments and recompenses. Excuses were now too late. The negligent and disobedient were sent to labor in the dark mines, while the faithful and obedient, arrayed in bright robes, were received into their glorious abodes of happiness. I have finished my parable, my dear children. Reflect on it, and profit by it. Fritz, what do you think of it? I am considering the goodness of the great king, and the ingratitude of his people," answered he. And how foolish they were, said Ernest. With a little prudence they might have kept their land in good condition, and secured a pleasant life afterwards. Away with them to the mines, cried Jack. They richly deserve such a doom. How much I should like, said Francis, to see those soldiers in their shining armor. I hope you will see them some day, my dear boy, if you continue to be good and obedient. I then explained my parable fully, and applied the moral to each of my sons directly. You, Fritz, should take warning from the people who planted wild fruit, and wish to make them pass for good fruit, such as those who are proud of natural virtues, easy to exercise, such as bodily strength or physical courage and place these above the qualities which are only attained by labor and patience. You, Ernest, must remember the subjects who laid out their land in flowery gardens, like those who seek the pleasures of life rather than the duties. And you, my thoughtless Jack, and little Francis, think of the fate of those who left their land untilled, 
or heedlessly sold tares for wheat. These are God's people who neither study nor reflect, who cast to the winds all instruction, and leave room in their minds for evil. Then let us all be, like the good laborers of the parable, constantly cultivating our ground, that when death comes for us, we may willingly follow him to the feet of the great king, to hear these blessed words, Good and faithful servants, enter into the joy of your Lord. This made a great impression on my children. We concluded by singing a hymn. Then my good wife produced from her unfailing bag a copy of the Holy Scripture, from which I selected such passages as applied to our situation, and explained them to my best ability. My boys remained for some time thoughtful and serious, and though they followed their innocent recreations during the day, they did not lose sight of the useful lesson of the morning, but by a more gentle and amiable manner showed that my words had taken effect. The next morning Ernest had used my bow, which I had given him, very skillfully, bringing down some dozens of small birds, a sort of ortolan, from the branches of our tree where they assembled to feed on the figs. This induced them all to wish for such a weapon. I was glad to comply with their wishes, as I wished them to become skillful in the use of these arms of our forefathers, which might be of great value to us when our ammunition failed. I made two bows and two quivers to contain their arrows, of a flexible piece of bark, and attaching a strap to them, I soon armed my little archers. Fritz was engaging in preparing the skin of the margay, with more care than Jack had shown with that of the jackal. I showed him how to clean it, by rubbing it with sand in the river, till no vestige of fat or flesh was left, and then applying butter to render it flexible. These employments filled up the morning till dinner-time came. We had earnest ortolans, and some fried ham and eggs, which made us a sumptuous repast. I gave my boys leave to kill as many orderlands as they chose, for I knew that, half-roasted and put into casks, covered with butter, they would keep for a length of time, and prove an invaluable resource in time of need. As I continued my work making arrows and a bow for Francis, I intimated to my wife that the abundant supply of figs would save our grain, as the poultry and pigeons would feed on them, as well as the orderlands. This was a great satisfaction to her. And thus another day passed, and we mounted to our dormitory to taste the sweet slumber that follows a day of toil. End of chapter. Chapter 13 The next morning all were engaged in archery. I completed the bow for Francis, and at his particular request made him a quiver too. The delicate bark of a tree, united by glue, obtained from our portable soup, formed an admirable quiver. This I suspended by a string round the neck of my boy, furnished with arrows. Then, taking his bow in his hand, he was as proud as a knight, armed at all points. After dinner, I proposed that we should give names to all the parts of our island known to us, in order that, by a pleasing delusion, we might fancy ourselves in an inhabited country. My proposal was well received, and then began the discussion of names. Jack wished for something high-sounding and difficult, such as Monomotapa, or Zanguabar, very difficult words, to puzzle anyone who visited our island. But I objected to this, as we were the most likely to have to use the names ourselves, and we should suffer from it. I rather suggested that we should give, in our own language, such simple names as should point out some circumstance connected with the spot. I proposed we should begin with the bay where we landed, and called on Fritz for his name. "'The Bay of Oysters?' said he. "'We found so many there.' "'Oh, no!' said Jack. "'Let it be Lobster Bay, for there I was caught by the leg.' "'Then we ought to call it the Bay of Tears,' said Ernest, "'to commemorate those you shed on the occasion.' "'My advice,' said my wife, "'is that in gratitude to God we should name it Safety Bay.' 
We were all pleased with this name, and proceeded to give the name of Tent House to our first abode, Shark Island to the little island in the bay where we had found that animal, and at Jack's desire the marshy spot where we had cut our arrows was named Flamingo Marsh. There the height from which we had vainly sought traces of our shipmates received the name of Cape Disappointment. The river was to be Jackal River, and the bridge Family Bridge. The most difficult point was to name our present abode. At last we agreed on the name of Falcon's Nest, in German Falkenhoist. This was received with acclamations, and I poured out for my young nestlings each a glass of sweet wine, to drink prosperity to Falcon's Nest. We thus laid the foundation of the geography of our new country, promising to forward it to Europe by the first post. After dinner, my sons returned to their occupation as tanners, Fritz to complete his belt, and Jack to make a sort of cuirass of the formidable skin of the porcupine to protect the dogs. He finished by making a sort of helmet from the head of the animal, as strange as the cuirasses. The heat of the day being over, we prepared to set out to walk to Tent House, to renew our stock of provisions, and endeavor to bring the geese and ducks to our new residence. But, instead of going by the coast, we proposed to go up the river till we reached the chain of rocks, and continue under their shade till we got to the cascade, where we could cross and return by family bridge. This was approved, and we set out. Fritz decorated with a beautiful belt of skin, Jack in his porcupine helmet. Each had a gun and game bag, except Francis, who, with his pretty fair face, his golden hair, and his bow and quiver, was a perfect Cupid. My wife was loaded with a large butter pot for a fresh supply. Turk walked before us with his coat of mail, and Flora followed, keeping at a respectful distance from him for fear of the darts. Nips, as my boys called the monkey, finding this new saddle very inconvenient, jumped off with many contortions, but soon fixed on Flora, who, not being able to shake him off, was compelled to become his palfrey. The road by the river was smooth and pleasant. When we reached the end of the wood, the country seemed more open, and now the boys, who had been rambling about, came running up out of breath. Ernest was holding a plant with leaves and flowers and green apples hanging on it. Potatoes, said he. I am certain they are potatoes. God be praised, said I. This precious plant will secure provision for a colony. Well, said Jack, if his superior knowledge discover them, I will be the first to dig them up. And he set to work so ardently that we soon had a bag of fine ripe potatoes, which we carried on to Tent House. End of chapter. Chapter 14 we had been much delighted with the new and lovely scenery of our road, the prickly cactus and aloe with its white flowers, the Indian fig, the white and yellow jasmine, the fragrant vanilla throwing round its graceful festoons. Above all, the regal pineapple grew in profusion, and we feasted on it, for the first time, with avidity. Among the prickly stalks of the cactus and aloes, I perceived a plant with large pointed leaves, which I knew to be the karata. I pointed out to the boys its beautiful red flowers. The leaves are an excellent application to wounds, and thread is made from the filaments, and the pith of the stem is used by the savage tribes for tinder. When I showed the boys by experiment the use of the pith, they thought the tinder tree would be almost as useful as the potatoes. At all events, I said, it will be more useful than the pineapples. Your mother will be thankful for thread when her enchanted bag is exhausted. How happy it is for us, said she, that you have devoted yourself to reading and study. In our ignorance we might have passed this treasure without suspecting its value. Fritz inquired of what use in the world all the rest of these prickly plants could be, which wounded every one that came near. "'All these have their use, Fritz,' said I. "'Some contain juices and gums, which are daily made use of in medicine. Others are useful in the arts or in manufactures. 
The Indian fig, for instance, is a most interesting tree. It grows in the most arid soil. The fruit is said to be sweet and wholesome. In a moment, my little active Jack was climbing the rocks to gather some of these figs, but he had not remarked that they were covered with thousands of slender thorns, finer than the finest needles, which terribly wounded his fingers. He returned, weeping bitterly and dancing with pain. Having rallied him a little for his greediness, I extracted the thorns, and then showed him how to open the fruit, by first cutting off the pointed end, as it lay on the ground, into this I fixed a piece of stick, and then pared it with my knife. The novelty of the expedient recommended it, and they were soon all engaged eating the fruit, which they declared was very good. In the meantime I saw Ernest examining one of the figs very attentively. "'Oh, papa,' said he, "'what a singular sight! The fig is covered with a small red insect. I cannot shake them off.' Can they be the cochineal? I recognized at once the precious insect, of which I explained to my sons the nature and use. It is with this insect, said I, that the beautiful and rich scarlet dye is made. It is found in America, and the Europeans give its weight in gold for it. Thus discoursing on the wonders of nature, and the necessity of increasing our knowledge by observation and study, we arrived at Tent House, and found it in the same state as we left it. We all began to collect necessaries. Fritz loaded himself with powder and shot. I opened the butter cask, and my wife and little Francis filled the pot. Ernest and Jack went to try and secure the geese and ducks, but they had become so wild that it would have been impossible, if Ernest had not thought of an expedient. He tied pieces of cheese, for bait, to threads which he floated on the water. The voracious creatures immediately swallowed the cheese and were drawn out by the thread. They were then securely tied and fastened to the game bags to be carried home on our backs. As the bait could not be recovered, the boys contented themselves with cutting off the string close to the beak, leaving them to digest the rest. Our bags were already loaded with potatoes, but we filled up the spaces between them with salt and having relieved Turk of his armor, we placed the heaviest on his back. I took the butter-pot, and after replacing everything and closing our tent, we resumed our march with our ludicrous encumbrances. The geese and ducks were very noisy in their adieu to their old marsh, the dogs barked, and we all laughed so excessively that we forgot our burdens till we sat down again under our tree. My wife soon had her pot of potatoes on the fire. She then milked the cow and goat, while I set the fowls at liberty on the banks of the river. We then sat down to a smoking dish of potatoes, a jug of milk, and butter and cheese. After supper we had prayers, thanking God especially for His new benefits, and we then sought our repose amongst the leaves. End of chapter Chapter 15 I had observed on the shore, the preceding day, a quantity of wood, which I thought would suit to make a sledge to convey our casks and heavy stores from Tent House to Falcon's Nest. At dawn of day I woke Ernest, whose inclination to indolence I wished to overcome, and, leaving the rest asleep, we descended, and harnessing the ass to a strong branch of the tree that was lying near, we proceeded to the shore. I had no difficulty in selecting proper pieces of wood. We sawed them the right length, tied them together, and laid them across the bow, which the patient animal drew very contentedly. We added to the load a small chest we discovered half buried in the sand, and we returned homewards, Ernest leading the ass, and I assisted by raising the load with a lever when we met with any obstruction. My wife had been rather alarmed. But, seeing the result of our expedition, and hearing of the prospect of a sledge, she was satisfied. I opened the chest, which contained only some sailors' dresses and some linen, both wetted with sea-water, but likely to be very useful as our own clothes decayed. I found Fritz and Jack had been shooting orderlands. They had killed about fifty, 
and had consumed so much powder and shot, that I trekked a prodigality so imprudent in our situation. I taught them to make snares for the birds of the threads we drew from the karata leaves we had brought home. My wife and her two younger sons busied themselves with these, while I, with my two elder boys, began to construct the sledge. As we were working, we heard a great noise among the fowls, and Ernest, looking about, discovered the monkey seizing and hiding the eggs from the nest. He had collected a good store in a hole among the roots, which Ernest carried to his mother, and Nips was punished by being tied up every morning till the eggs were collected. Our work was interrupted by dinner, composed of ortolans, milk, and cheese. After dinner, Jack had climbed to the higher branches of the trees to place his snares, and found the pigeons were making nests. I then told him to look often to the snares, for fear our own poor birds should be taken, and above all, never in future, to fire into the tree. Papa, said little Francis, can we not sow some gunpowder, and then we shall have plenty? This proposal was received with shouts of laughter which greatly discomposed the little innocent fellow. Professor Ernest immediately seized the opportunity to give a lecture on the composition of gunpowder. At the end of the day, my sledge was finished. Two long curved planks of wood, crossed by three pieces at a distance from each other, formed the simple conveyance. The fore and hind parts were in the form of horns to keep the load from falling off. Two ropes were fastened to the front, and my sledge was complete. My wife was delighted with it, and hoped I would now set out immediately to Tent House for the butter cask. I made no objection to this, and Ernest and I prepared to go, and leave Fritz in charge of the family. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 When we were ready to set out, Fritz presented each of us with a little case he had made from the skin of the margay. They were ingeniously contrived to contain knife, fork, and spoon, and a small hatchet. We then harnessed the ass and the cow to the sledge, took a flexible bamboo cane for a whip, and, followed by Flora, we departed, leaving Turk to guard the tree. We went by the shore, as the better road for the sledge, and crossing Family Bridge were soon at Tent House. After unharnessing the animals, we began to load. We took the cask of butter, the cheese, and the biscuit, all the rest of our utensils, powder, shot, and Turk's armor, which we had left there. These labors had so occupied us that we had not observed that our animals, attracted by the pasturage, had crossed the bridge and wandered out of sight. I sent Ernest to seek them, and in the meantime went to the bay where I discovered some convenient little hollows in the rock that seemed cut out for baths. I called Ernest to come, and till he arrived employed myself in cutting some rushes which I thought might be useful. When my son came I found he had ingeniously removed the first planks from the bridge to prevent the animal straying over again. We then had a very pleasant bath, and Ernest being out first I sent him to the rock where the salt was accumulated to fill a small bag, to be transferred to the large bags on the ass. He had not been absent long, when I heard him cry out, Papa, Papa, a huge fish! I cannot hold it, it will break my line! I ran to his assistance, and found him lying on the ground on his face, tugging at his line, to which an enormous salmon was attached, and that had nearly pulled him into the water. I let it have a little more line, then drew it gently into a shallow, and secured it. It appeared about fifteen pounds weight, and we pleased ourselves with the idea of presenting this to our good cook. Ernest said he remembered having remarked how this place swarmed with fish, and he took care to bring his rod with him. He had taken about a dozen small fishes, which he had in his handkerchief, before he was overpowered by the salmon. I cut the fishes open, and rubbed the inside with salt to preserve them. Then, placing them in a small box on the sledge, and adding our bags of salt, we harnessed our animals and set off homewards. When we were about halfway, Flora left us, and by her barking raised a singular animal, which seemed to leap instead of run. 
The irregular bounds of the animal disconcerted my aim, and, though very near, I missed it. Ernest was more fortunate. He fired at it and killed it. It was an animal about the size of a sheep, with the tail of a tiger. Its head and skin were like those of a mouse, ears longer than the hair. There was a curious pouch on the belly. The forelegs were short, as if imperfectly developed, and armed with strong claws, the hind legs long, like a pair of stilts. After Ernest's pride of victory was a little subdued, he fell back on his science, and began to examine his spoil. "'By its teeth,' said he, "'it should belong to the family of rodents or gnawers, by its legs to the jumpers, and by its pouch to the opossum tribe.' This gave me the right clue. Then, said I, this must be the animal Cook first discovered in New Holland, and it is called the kangaroo. We now tied the legs of the animal together, and, putting a stick through, carried it to the sledge very carefully, for Ernest was anxious to preserve the beautiful skin. Our animals were heavily laden, but, giving them a little rest and some fresh grass, we once more started and in a short time reached Falcon's Nest. My wife had been employed during our absence in washing the clothes of the three boys, clothing them in the meantime from the sailor's chest we had found a few days before. Their appearance was excessively ridiculous, as the garments neither suited their age nor size, and caused great mirth to us all, but my wife had preferred this disguise to the alternative of their going naked. We now began to display our riches and relate our adventures. The butter and the rest of the provisions were very welcome, and the salmon still more so. But the sight of the kangaroo produced screams of admiration. Fritz displayed a little jealousy, but soon surmounted it by an exertion of his nobler feelings, and only the keen eye of a father could have discovered it. He congratulated Ernest warmly but could not help begging to accompany me next time. "'I promise you that,' said I, "'as a reward for the conquest you have achieved over your jealousy of your brother. But remember, I could not have given you a greater proof of my confidence than in leaving you to protect your mother and brothers. A noble mind finds its purest joy in the accomplishment of its duty, and to that willingly sacrifices its inclination.' But, I added, in a low tone, lest I should distress my wife, I propose another expedition to the vessel, and you must accompany me. We then fed our tired animals, giving them some salt with their grass, a great treat to them. Some salmon was prepared for dinner, and the rest salted. After dinner I hung up the kangaroo till next day, when we intended to salt and smoke the flesh. Evening arrived and an excellent supper of fish, ortolans, and potatoes refreshed us, and, after thanks to God, we retired to rest. End of chapter Chapter 17 I rose early, and descended the ladder a little uneasy about my kangaroo, and found I was but just in time to save it, for my dogs had so enjoyed their repast on the entrails which I had given them the night before, that they wished to appropriate the rest. They had succeeded in tearing off the head which was in their reach, and were devouring it in a sort of growling partnership. As we had no storeroom for our provision, I decided to administer a little correction as a warning to these gluttons. I gave them some smart strokes with a cane, and they fled howling to the stable under the roots. Their cries roused my wife, who came down, and though she could not but allow the chastisement to be just and prudent, she was so moved by compassion that she consoled the poor sufferers with some remains of last night's supper. I now carefully stripped the kangaroo of his elegant skin, and washing myself and changing my dress after this unpleasant operation, I joined my family at breakfast. I then announced my plan of visiting the vessel, and ordered Fritz to begin preparations. My wife resigned herself mournfully to the necessity. When we were ready to depart, 
Ernest and Jack were not to be found. Their mother suspected they had gone to get potatoes. This calmed my apprehension, but I charged her to reprimand them for going without leave. We set out towards Tent House, leaving Flora to protect the household, and taking our guns as usual. We had scarcely left the wood and were approaching Jackal River, when we heard piercing cries, and suddenly Ernest and Jack leaped from a thicket, delighted, as Jack said, in having succeeded in their plan of accompanying us, and, moreover, in making us believe we were beset with savages. They were, however, disappointed. I gave them a severe reproof for their disobedience, and sent them home with a message to their mother that I thought we might be detained all night, and begged she would not be uneasy. They listened to me in great confusion, and were much mortified at their dismissal but I begged Fritz to give Ernest his silver watch, that they might know how the time passed, and I knew that I could replace it, as there was a case of watches in the ship. This reconciled them a little to their lot, and they left us. We went forward to our boat, embarked, and aided by the current, soon reached the vessel. My first care was to construct some more convenient transport vessel than our boat. Fritz proposed a raft, similar to those used by savage nations, supported on skins filled with air. These we had not, but we found a number of water hogsheads, which we emptied and closed again, and threw a dozen of them into the sea, between the ship and our boat. Some long planks were laid on these, and secured with ropes. We added a raised edge of planks to secure our cargo, and thus had a solid raft, capable of conveying any burden. This work occupied us the whole day, scarcely interrupted by eating a little cold meat from our game bags. Exhausted by fatigue, we were glad to take a good night's rest in the captain's cabin on an elastic mattress, of which our hammocks had made us forget the comfort. Early next morning we began to load our raft. We began by entirely stripping our own cabin and that of the captain. We carried away even the doors and windows. The chests of the carpenter and the gunner followed. There were cases of rich jewelry and caskets of money, which at first tempted us, but were speedily relinquished for objects of real utility. I preferred a case of young plants of European fruits, carefully packed in moss for transportation. I saw with delight among these precious plants apple, pear, plum, orange, apricot, peach, almond, and chestnut trees, and some young shoots of vines. How I longed to plant these familiar trees of home in a foreign soil! We secured some bars of iron and pigs of lead, grindstones, cartwheels ready for mounting, tongs, shovels, plowshares, packets of copper and iron wire, sacks of maize, peas, oats, and vetches, and even a small hand mill. The vessel had been, in fact, laden with everything likely to be useful in a new colony. We found a sawmill in pieces, but marked, so that it could be easily put together. It was difficult to select, but we took as much as was safe on the raft, adding a large fishing net and the ship's compass. Fritz begged to take the harpoons, which he hung by the ropes over the bow of the boat, and I indulged his fancy. We were now loaded as far as prudence would allow us. So, attaching our raft firmly to the boat, we hoisted our sail, and made slowly to the shore. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 The wind was favorable, but we advanced slowly, the floating mass that we had to tug retarding us. Fritz had been some time regarding a large object in the water. He called me to steer a little towards it, that he might see what it was. I went to the rudder and made the movement. Immediately I heard the whistling of the cord and felt a shock, then a second, which was followed by a rapid motion of the boat. "'We're going to founder!' cried I. "'What's the matter?' "'I've caught it!' shouted Fritz. "'I've harpooned it in the neck. It is a turtle!' I saw the harpoon shining at a distance, and the turtle was rapidly drawing us along by the line. I lowered the sail and rushed forward to cut the line but Fritz besought me not to do it. 
He assured me there was no danger, and that he himself would release us, if necessary. I reluctantly consented, and saw our whole convoy drawn by an animal whose agony increased its strength. As we drew near the shore, I endeavored to steer so that we might not strike and be capsized. I saw after a few minutes that our conductor again wanted to make out to sea. I therefore hoisted the sail, and the wind being in our favor, he found resistance vain, and tugging as before, followed up the current, only taking more to the left towards Falcon's Nest, and landing us in a shallow, rested on the shore. I leaped out of the boat, and with a hatchet soon put our powerful conductor out of his misery. Fritz uttered a shout of joy and fired off his gun, as a signal of our arrival. All came running to greet us, and great was their surprise, not only at the value of our cargo, but at the strange mode by which it had been brought into harbour. My first care was to send them for the sledge to remove some of our load without delay, and as the ebbing tide was leaving our vessels almost dry on the sand, I profited by the opportunity to secure them. By the aid of the jack screw and levers, we raised and brought to the shore two large pieces of lead from the raft. These served for anchors, and, connected to the boat and raft by strong cables, fixed them safely. As soon as the sledge arrived, we placed the turtle with some difficulty on it, as it weighed at least three hundred weight. We added some lighter articles, the mattresses, some small chests, etc., and proceeded with our first load to Falcon's Nest in great spirits. As we walked on, Fritz told them of the wondrous cases of jewelry we had abandoned for things of use. Jack wished Fritz had brought him a gold snuff-box to hold curious seeds, and Francis wished for some of the money to buy gingerbread at the fair. Everybody laughed at the little simpleton, who could not help laughing himself when he remembered his distance from fairs. Arrived at home, our first care was to turn the turtle on his back, to get the excellent meat out of the shell. With my hatchet I separated the cartilages that unite the shells. The upper shell is convex, the lower one nearly flat. We had some of the turtle prepared for dinner, though my wife felt great repugnance in touching the green fat, notwithstanding my assurance of it being the chief delicacy to an epicure. We salted the remainder of the flesh, and gave the offal to the dogs. The boys were all clamorous to possess the shell, but I said it belonged to Fritz, by right of conquest, and he must dispose of it as he thought best. Then, said he, I will make a basin of it and place it near the river, that my mother may always keep it full of fresh water. Very good, said I and we will fill our basin as soon as we find some clay to make a solid foundation. I found some this morning, said Jack, a whole bed of clay, and I brought these balls home to show you. And I have made a discovery too, said Ernest. Look at these roots, like radishes. I have not eaten any, but the sow enjoys them very much. A most valuable discovery indeed, said I. If I am not mistaken, this is the root of the manioc which, with the potatoes, would ensure us from famine. Of this root they make in the West Indies a sort of bread, called cassava bread. In its natural state it contains a violent poison, but by a process of heating it it becomes wholesome. The nutritious tapioca is a preparation from this root. By this time we had unloaded, and proceeded to the shore to bring a second load before night came on. We brought up two chests of our own clothes and property, some chests of tools, the cartwheels, and the hand mill, likely now to be of use for the cassava. After unloading, we sat down to an excellent supper of turtle, with potatoes instead of bread. After supper, my wife said, smiling, After such a hard day, I think I can give you something to restore you. She then brought a bottle and glasses and filled us each a glass of clear, amber-colored wine. I found it excellent Malaga. She had been down to the shore the previous day, and there found a small cask thrown up by the waves. This, with the assistance of her sons, she had rolled up to the foot of our tree, 
and there covered it with leaves to keep it cool till our arrival. We were so invigorated by this cordial that we set briskly to work to hoist up our mattresses to our dormitory, which we accomplished by the aid of ropes and pulleys. My wife received and arranged them, and after our usual evening devotions, we gladly lay down on them to enjoy a night of sweet repose. End of chapter. Chapter 19 I rose before daylight, and, leaving my family sleeping, descended to go to the shore to look after my vessels. I found all the animals moving. The dogs leaped about me, the cocks were crowing, the goats browsing on the dewy grass. The ass alone was sleeping, and as he was the assistant I wanted, I was compelled to rouse him, a preference which did not appear to flatter him. Nevertheless, I harnessed him to the sledge, and, followed by the dogs, went forward to the coast, where I found my boat and raft safe at anchor. I took up a moderate load and came home to breakfast, but found all still as I left them. I called my family, and they sprung up ashamed of their sloth. My wife declared it must have been the good mattress that had charmed her. I gave my boys a short admonition for their sloth. We then came down to a hasty breakfast, and returned to the coast to finish the unloading of the boats, that I might, at high water, take them round to moor at the usual place in the Bay of Safety. I sent my wife up with the last load, while Fritz and I embarked, and, seeing Jack watching us, I consented that he should form one of the crew, for I had determined to make another visit to the wreck before I moored my craft. When we reached the vessel, the day was so far advanced that we only had time to collect hastily anything easy to embark. My sons ran over the ship. Jack came trundling a wheelbarrow, which he said would be excellent for fetching the potatoes in. But Fritz brought me good news. He had found, between decks, a beautiful pinnace, a small vessel of which the prow is square, taken to pieces, with all its fittings, and even two small guns. I saw that all the pieces were numbered and placed in order. Nothing was wanting. I felt the importance of this acquisition. But it would take days of labor to put it together. And then how could we launch it? At present, I felt I must renounce the undertaking. I returned to my loading. It consisted of all sorts of utensils, a copper boiler, some plates of iron, tobacco graters, two grindstones, a barrel of powder, and one of flints. Jack did not forget his wheelbarrow, and we found two more, which we added to our cargo, and then sailed off speedily to avoid the land wind which rises in the evening. As we drew near, we were astonished to see a row of little creatures standing on the shore, apparently regarding us with much curiosity. They were dressed in black, with white waistcoats and thick cravats. Their arms hung down carelessly, but from time to time they raised them as if they wished to bestow on us a fraternal embrace. <laughs> I believe, said I, laughing, this must be the country of pygmies, and they are coming to welcome us. They are the Lilliputians, father, said Jack. I have read of them, but I thought they had been less. As if Gulliver's travels were true, said Fritz in a tone of derision. Then there are no pygmies, asked he. No, my dear boy, said I, all these stories are either the invention or the mistakes of ancient navigators, who have taken troops of monkeys for men, or who have wished to repeat something marvelous. But the romance of Gulliver is an allegory intended to convey great truths. And now, said Fritz, I begin to see our pygmies have beaks and wings. You're right, said I. They are penguins, as Ernest explained to us some time since. They are good swimmers, but, unable to fly, are very helpless on land. I steered gently to the shore, that I might not disturb them, but Jack leaped into the water up to his knees, and, dashing among the penguins with a stick, struck right and left, knocking down half a dozen of the poor stupid birds before they were aware. Some of these we brought away alive. The rest, not liking such a reception, took to the water and were soon out of sight. I scolded Jack for his useless rashness, for the flesh of the penguin is by no means a delicacy. We now filled our three wheelbarrows with such things as we could carry, 
not forgetting the sheets of iron and the graters, and trudged home. Our dogs announced our approach, and all rushed out to greet us. A curious and merry examination commenced. They laughed at my graters, but I let them laugh, for I had a project in my head. The penguins I intended for our poultry yard, and for the present I ordered the boys to tie each of them by a leg to one of our geese or ducks, who opposed the bondage very clamorously, but necessity made them submissive. My wife showed me a large store of potatoes and manioc roots, which she and her children had dug up the evening before. We then went to supper, and talked of all we had seen in the vessel, especially of the pinnace, which we had been obliged to leave. My wife did not feel much regret on this account, as she dreaded maritime expeditions, though she agreed she might have felt less uneasiness if we had had a vessel of this description. I gave my sons a charge to rise early next morning, as we had an important business on hand, and curiosity roused them all in very good time. After our usual preparations for the day, I addressed them thus. Gentlemen, I am going to teach you all a new business, that of a baker. Give me the plates of iron and the graters we brought yesterday. My wife was astonished, but I requested her to wait patiently, and she should have bread, not perhaps light buns, but eatable flat cakes. But first she was to make me two small bags of sailcloth. She obeyed me, but at the same time I observed she put the potatoes on the fire, a proof she had not much faith in my bread-making. I then spread a cloth over the ground, and giving each of the boys a grater, we began to grate the carefully washed manioc roots, resting the end on the cloth. In a short time we had a heap of what appeared to be moist white sawdust, certainly not tempting to the appetite but the little workmen were amused with their labor and jested no little about the cakes made of scraped radishes. "'Laugh now, boys,' said I. "'We shall see after a while. But you, Ernest, ought to know that manioc is one of the most precious of elementary roots, forming the principal sustenance of many nations of America, and often preferred by Europeans who inhabit those countries to wheat and bread. When all the roots were grated, I filled the two bags closely with the pollard, and my wife sewed the ends up firmly. It was now necessary to apply strong pressure to extract the juice from the root, as this juice is a deadly poison. I selected an oak beam, one end of which we fixed between the roots of our tree. Beneath this I placed our bags on a row of little blocks of wood. I then took a large bough, which I had cut from a tree and prepared for the purpose, and laid it across them. We all united then in drawing down the opposite end of the plank over the bow, till we got it to a certain point, when we suspended to it the heaviest substances we possessed, hammers, bars of iron, and masses of lead. This acting upon the manioc, the sap burst through the cloth, and flowed on the ground copiously. When I thought the pressure was complete, we relieved the bags from the lever, and opening one, drew out a handful of the pollard, still rather moist, resembling coarse maize flour. "'It only wants a little heat to complete our success,' said I, in great delight. I ordered a fire to be lighted, and fixing one of our iron plates, which was round in form, and rather concave, on two stones placed on each side of the fire, I covered it with a flour which we took from the bag with a small wooden shovel. It soon formed a solid cake, which we turned, that it might be equally baked. It smelled so good that we all wished to commence eating immediately, and I had some difficulty in convincing them that this was only a trial, and that our baking was still imperfect. Besides, as I had told them that there were three kinds of manioc, of which one contained more poison than the rest, I thought it prudent to try whether we had perfectly extracted it, by giving a small quantity to our fowls. As soon, therefore, as the cake was cold, I gave some to two chickens, which I kept apart, and also some to Master Nips the monkey, that he might, for the first time, do us a little service. He ate it with so much relish, and such grimaces of enjoyment, 
that my young party were quite anxious to share his feast, but I ordered them to wait till we could judge of the effect, and, leaving our employment, we went to our dinner of potatoes, to which my wife had added one of the penguins, which was truly rather tough and fishy. But as Jack would not allow this, and declared it was a dish fit for a king, we allowed him to regale on it as much as he liked. During dinner, I talked to them of the various preparations made from the manioc. I told my wife we could obtain an excellent starch from the expressed juice, but this did not interest her much, as at present she usually wore the dress of a sailor for convenience, and had neither caps nor collars to starch. The cake made from the root is called by the natives of the Antilles cassava, and in no savage nation do we find any word signifying bread, an article of food unknown to them. We spoke of poisons, and I explained to my sons the different nature and effects of them. Especially I warned them against the mancanil, which ought to grow in this part of the world. I described the fruit to them as resembling a tempting yellow apple with red spots, which is one of the most deadly poisons. It is said that even to sleep under the tree is dangerous. I forbade them to taste any unknown fruit, and they promised to obey me. On leaving the table, we went to visit the victims of our experiment. Jack whistled for Nips, who came in three bounds from the summit of a high tree, where he had doubtless been plundering some nest, and his vivacity, and the peaceful cackling of the fowls, assured us our preparation was harmless. Now, gentlemen, said I, laughing, to the bakehouse, and let us see what we can do. I wished them each to try to make the cakes. They immediately kindled the fire, and heated the iron plate. In the meantime, I broke up a grated cassava, and mixed it with a little milk, and giving each of them a coconut basin filled with the paste, I showed them how to pour it with a spoon upon the plate, and spread it about. When the paste began to puff up, I judged it was baked on one side, and turned it like a pancake with a fork. And after a little time, we had a quantity of nice yellow biscuits, which, with a jug of milk, made us a delicious collation and determined us without delay to set about cultivating the manioc. The rest of the day was employed in bringing up the remainder of our cargo, by means of the sledge and the useful wheelbarrows. End of chapter. Chapter 20 The next morning I decided on returning to the wreck. The idea of the pinnace continually haunted my mind and left me no repose. But it was necessary to take all the hands I could raise, and, with difficulty, I got my wife's consent to take my three elder sons, on promising her we would return in the evening. We set out, taking provision for the day, and soon arrived at the vessel, when my boys began to load the raft with all manner of portable things. But the great matter was the pinnace. It was contained in the afterhold of the vessel, immediately below the officers' berths. My sons, with all the ardor of their age, begged to begin by clearing a space in the vessel to put the pinnace together, and we might afterwards think how we should launch it. Under any other circumstances I should have shown them the folly of such an undertaking, but in truth I had myself a vague hope of success that encouraged me, and I cried out, To work! To work! The hold was lighted by some chink in the ship's side. We set diligently to work, hacking, cutting, and sawing away all obstacles, and before evening we had a clear space round us. But now it was necessary to return, and we put to sea with our cargo, purposing to continue our work daily. On reaching the Bay of Safety we had the pleasure of finding my wife and Francis, who had established themselves at Tent House intending to continue there till our visits to the vessel were concluded, that they might always keep us in sight, and spare us the unnecessary labor of a walk after our day's work. I thanked my wife tenderly for this kind sacrifice, for I knew how much she enjoyed the cool shade of Falcon's Nest, and in return I showed her the treasures we had brought her from the vessel, consisting of two barrels of salt butter, three hogsheads of flour, 
several bags of millet, rice, and other grains, and a variety of useful household articles, which she conveyed with great delight to our storehouse in the rocks. For a week we spent every day in the vessel, returning in the evening to enjoy a good supper and talk of our progress and my wife, happily engrossed with her poultry and other household cares, got accustomed to our absence. With much hard labor, the pinnace was at last put together. Its construction was light and elegant. It looked as if it would sail well. At the head was a short half-deck. The masts and sails were like those of a brigantine. We carefully caulked all the seams with tow, dipped in melted tar, and we even indulged ourselves by placing the two small guns in it, fastened by chains. And there stood the beautiful little bark, immovable on the stocks. We admired it incessantly, but what could we do to get it afloat? The difficulty of forcing a way through the mighty timbers lined with copper that formed the side of the ship was insurmountable. Suddenly, suggested by the excess of my despair, a bold but dangerous idea presented itself to me, in which all might be lost as well as all gained. I said nothing about this to my children, to avoid the vexation of a possible disappointment, but began to execute my plan. I found a cast-iron mortar, exactly fitted for my purpose, which I filled with gunpowder. I then took a strong oak plank to cover it, to which I fixed iron hooks, so that they could reach the handles of the mortar. I cut a groove in the side of the plank, that I might introduce a long match, which should burn at least two hours before it reached the powder. I placed the plank then over the mortar, fastened the hooks through the handles, surrounded it with pitch, and then bound some strong chains round the hole, to give it greater solidity. I proceeded to suspend this infernal machine against the side of the ship near our work, taking care to place it where the recoil from the explosion should not injure the pinnace. When all was ready, I gave the signal of departure, my sons having been employed in the boat, and not observing my preparations. I remained a moment to fire the match, and then hastily joined them with a beating heart, and proceeded to the shore. As soon as we reached our harbor, I detached the raft that I might return in the boat as soon as I heard the explosion. We began actively to unload the boat, and while thus employed, a report like thunder was heard. All trembled and threw down their load in terror. "'What can it be?' cried they. "'Perhaps a signal from some vessel in distress. Let's go to their assistance.' "'It came from the vessel,' said my wife. "'It must have blown up. You have not been careful of fire and have left some near a barrel of gunpowder.' "'At all events,' said I. We will go and ascertain the cause. Who'll go with me? By way of reply, my three sons leaped into the boat, and, consoling the anxious mother by a promise to return immediately, away we rowed. We never made the voyage so quickly. Curiosity quickened the movements of my sons, and I was all impatience to see the result of my project. As we approached, I was glad to see no appearance of flames, or even smoke. The position of the vessel did not seem altered. Instead of entering the vessel as usual, we rounded the prow and came opposite the other side. The greater part of the side of the ship was gone. The sea was covered with the remains of it. In its place stood our beautiful pinnace, quite uninjured, only leaning a little over the stocks. At the sight I cried out in a transport that amazed my sons, Victory! Victory! The charming vessel is our own. It will be easy now to launch her. Ah, I comprehend now, said Fritz. Papa has blown up the ship. But how could you manage to do it so exactly? I explained all to him, as we entered through the broken side of the devoted vessel. I soon ascertained that no fire remained, and that the pinnace had escaped any injury. We set to work to clear away all the broken timbers in our way, and by the aid of the jack-screw and levers, we moved the pinnace, which we had taken care to build on rollers, to the opening, then attaching a strong cable to her head, and fixing the other end to the most solid part of the ship, we easily launched her. 
it was too late to do any more now except carefully securing our prize and we returned to the good mother to whom wishing to give her an agreeable surprise we merely said that the side of the vessel was blown out with powder but we were still able to obtain more from it at which she sighed and in her heart i have no doubt wished the vessel and all it contained at the bottom of the sea we had two days of incessant labor in fitting and loading the pinnace finally after putting up our masts ropes and sails we selected a cargo of things our boats could not bring when all was ready my boys obtained permission as a reward for their industry to salute their mamma as we entered the bay by firing our two guns fritz was captain and ernest and jack at his command put their matches to the guns and fired my wife and little boy rushed out in alarm but our joyful shouts soon reassured them and they were ready to welcome us with astonishment and delight fritz placed a plank from the pinnace to the shore and assisting his mother she came on board they gave her a new salute and christened the vessel the elizabeth after her my wife praised our skill and perseverance but begged we would not suppose that francis and she had been idle during our long absence we moored the little fleet safely to the shore and followed her up the river to the cascade where we saw a neat garden laid out in beds and walks this is our work said she the soil here being chiefly composed of decayed leaves is light and easy to dig there i have my potatoes there manioc roots these are sown with peas beans and lentils in this row of beds are sown lettuces radishes cabbages and other european vegetables i have reserved one part for sugar canes on the high ground i have transplanted pineapples and sown melons finally round every bed i have sown a border of maize that the high bushy stems may protect the young plants from the sun i was delighted with the result of the labor and industry of a delicate female and a child and could scarcely believe it was accomplished in so short a time i must confess i had no great hope of success at first said my wife and this made me averse to speaking of it afterwards when i suspected you had a secret I determined to have one too and give you a surprise after again applauding these useful labors we returned to discharge our cargo and as we went my good elizabeth still full of horticultural plans reminded me of the young fruit trees we had brought from the vessel i promised to look after them next day and to establish my orchard near her kitchen garden we unloaded our vessels placed on the sledge all that might be useful at falcon's nest and arranging the rest under the tent fixed our pinnace to the shore by means of the anchor and a cord fastened to a heavy stone and at length set out to falcon's nest where we arrived soon to the great comfort of my wife who dreaded the burning plain at tent house End of chapter twenty